Well, there, friends. Oh, t okay. Just, just take over the whole thing, Tim, with your attire and your regalia. <laughs> this is welcome to the Gray Waste Tim channel here at the David Lightbringer channel. He's operating me like a sock puppet. We're all here for the glory of Tim, who's <laughs> high on shade of the evening and whatever else. Tim, how you feeling? How's your buzz? Good. Good. As long as I don't spill the shade of the evening on the computer this time, we'll be in good shape. Oh, the party doesn't start until you spill some on your hands and computer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. No, you're not late. I'm late. I start late. I'm not. Guys, I grew up going to rock shows. The band never goes on when it's supposed to. That's just how it is. So, welcome. This is going to be an Ironborn... Almost like an iceberg. It's kind of icebergy, to be honest. And let me just, oh, this looks, is this, yes. Okay, cool. Basically, what we're doing is we're going to go through all the sigils of the Ironborn, which means we're also going to go through their houses. We're going to go through the different islands. And then we're going to dive into the symbolism of the sigils. And the symbolism of the sigils will refer both to the stuff about the house and the main plot, um, some theories, some like main plot theories. And then of course, you know, Nissa Nissa and the Weirwood Ned and all my favorite shit. Wait till we get to drum and good brother folks. You're not ready. You're not ready. So this will be great. If you've, um, this will give you some basic out. I feel like by the time we're done with the stream, you guys are going to know the Ironborn houses a lot better, which islands they're from, which Island has like what personality and stuff like that. Uh, and we're also going to dive into just all kinds of crazy theories because the Ironborn symbolism is bonkers. Just like my co-host, Grayways Tim, whose channel, of course, is called Grayways Tim, where you can see him doing his thing <laughs> like like so. Yeah, like I've, I've done the Euron thing so many times. I feel it's expected of me now whenever we do Ironborn stuff, especially if we're going to do it as deep a dive as we are planning today. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, I had to keep thinking <laughs> about house Tawny and like house Merlin and houses that barely come up in the story. There's some interesting stuff in there. Uh, Brian Doss. Do you think the drowned halls are the other half of the weirwood net? No, but they symbolize the other half, the cold half, the others and the squishers are basically parallel. So, that one will tell us about the other. We've picked up on that for a while. Basically, the idea is that um, the others are monsters that come from the green sea. And the deep ones are the monsters that come from the regular sea. So I've got my ironic shirt on. It's super dry. It's not dry on the Iron Islands, Tim. It's very wet. So I'm <laughs> keeping dry. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Um, so that if this stream goes well, which I believe it will, then we'll do one of these for each region. Let's get into it, Tim. So, Iron Islands, I got some maps. We're going to do a little fun with maps. The Iron Islands, we think about the Ironborn as living on the Iron Islands, but in various times of your Tim, they have, of course, expanded their realms to basically everywhere where you could hear the sound of the sea, all the way down from the Arbor up to Bear Island. You can see there's a lot of coastline. You got the Shield Islands. Uh, yeah, Shield Islands there. Fair Isle. All these peninsulas and uh, yeah, Ironborn were all over all of it. So this is the southern stretch from the islands to the arbor. You can see in a little more detail. Again, the Shield Islands, um, High Garden and Old Town are both kind of on a river. In a, like High Garden is a little upriver, uh, but you can see like the the Ironborn uh, they threaten these cities by going into these bays. You know, up the mouth of the Mandor, Euron was pulling some chicanery there, luring the boats out, and then sailing his ships up the Mander to threaten High Garden. And he's uh, he's brewing around outside Old Town now. So this is the, the Ironborn are basically hiding out on these islands and then just raiding everybody. And it's very much in imitation of something called the Kingdom of the Isles, uh, which kind of existed in the Hebrides Islands in between Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland there. So actually right where Fingal's cave is, um, there, there was a, a Viking kingdom called the Kingdom of the Isles. And they basically, that's 
the closest ana uh, analog to what the Ironborn are doing. So then we go north here. Here's the northern coast. You can see the islands on the south, and then you got Cape Kraken, Salt Spear, the Stony Shore. That's where Asha lands her ships. Um, you know, and then uh, she goes to the Wolf's Wood. She's at Barrowton. Um, they see Sea Dragon Point up there, where the uh, the War King fought his war against the Starks, and then Bear Island. So that is the lay of the land, if you will. And then here are our islands themselves. There are the Bear Islands, Tim. And then we've got maps with sigils. So this is this is the overview map, and then we're going to go in on each island and the islands I put the sigils on, so you can sort of see where they all are. And uh, before we go any further, just real quick, you guys can support the program with the PayPal link in the description, and I've already got a couple, so let me thank Ludmila. Ironborn question. Could the Banefort Necromancer be a reference to a Night King figure? He's led his thralls into battle, and Necromancer's thralls are his whites. Was this the Night King or just an archetype figure? Uh, that would probably just be... Probably just an echo, I would say. <laughs> uh, to do the Bane voice, I need the... You gotta have like a thing to talk. You have to talk into a mask, you see. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's all like all the entire... So basically what I'm saying is that Morgan Baneford and the whole Baneford stuff parallels the idea of a Lord Reaper of Pike. And of course, the Harlaws add to the Reaper sy symbolism with their scythe. Um, so mm -hmm. all of that is essentially Night King archetype. And Tim, let me get you in on this. One of the things that um, you've noticed when we we're going through the Ironborn sigils is that almost always the symbolism is leaning towards the dead side of, of our various dichotomies, <laughs> the other side, you know, the, the drowned men, what is dead can never die, very obvious parallels for whites. And Euron talks about his other ships and his other captains and his other men and this and that and this and that, so... Yeah, because it very much is like like House Drum has the skeleton hand, uh, House Wench is the bloody moon. Uh, yeah, I broke down in my notes. I went through each island, named all the great houses on that island and uh, their sigil and who they supported it in the King's Moot. And yeah, you get a lot of death on like House. Uh, there's one that has their their sigil is 10 nooses. You got one that's a nine-headed hydra. It, it, it's, it's very crazy. Like they, they got like... Uh, Ironborn sigils go hard, just like Dorn. Dorn sigils go hard as well. And some of what uh, George is emulating here is the real Vikings and how they sort of played up their exaggerated reputation in order to instill fear and make their raiding more effective. That was a big part of it, the propaganda. Um, and that's why we got Hrothgar, the demon lover, and all these just outrageous names. Like a lot of it is intimidation. And we see the wildlings doing the same stuff. You know, they take on names and personas that are just as terrifying as they possibly can. They play play along, they play up to the rumors that the people south of the wall have about the wildlings. They're like, oh, you think we drink from skull cups? Well, yes, we, we love that. Ah, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a little bit of that going on with the Ironborn. <laughs> but it is, when you get down into the symbolism, it, it is all other associated. And of course, as you can see, someone who drinks Shade of the Evening this way and has blue lips what do they look like someone with frostbite so it's mm -hmm. like the whole the whole like everything about shade of the evening is other associated and of course shade of the evening long night darkness like you see how that goes um mm -hmm. so you've got this euron king king of the blue lips he's caught frostbite and, and during the long night like you guys can see what's going on here right and euron by the way we will get to euron sigil that's the last thing that we'll do that's the de the depth of the of the Ironborn iceberg, of course, that's the bottom. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is four twenty where, um, like in uh, Alaska somewhere. So cheers to uh, to everyone. Oh, no, 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 no. It's um, sorry, uh, Mountain Time four twenty. I went the other way. I, I I changed the rotation direction of the Earth for a second there, Tim. <laughs> it is Rocky Mountain High four twenty. So cheers. I wish the fat guy with the white beard became the king of the Iron Islands. Put a little respect on the name of Aaron Iron, Eric Ironmaker, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what house is he from? 
Uh, does it, it never said because they they give the last name they give the name Iron Maker, but there is no House Iron Maker. It just popped into my head that like we don't know. Yeah, it's just Eric like Andrew Breaker, the Un- just an Ironborn Raider. Oh, at, and the head of House Iron Maker. Oh, so, there is a. Uh, then we we are never told what their keep it's called or what island. No, on, it's going to be semi canon sources, which means the app or something like that. Um, let's see here. He did sail with Dagon Greyjoy, though, in his youth, and carries a big hammer. So he's definitely a cool dude. Oh, there are so many ads on Westeros.org. Jesus Christ, guys. We're going <laughs> to milk George Martin's repackaged information as hard as we can. Oh, yeah. I wish there was another resource to use other than Elio and Linda's website. I really do. That's why you need an ad block. Uh, it's just, there's like 14 ads on every page. It's just like, come on, you greedy fucks. Anyway, <laughs> not even your information. There's just such coattail riders. Disgusting. Anyway, anyway, Tim, <laughs> um, we're not going to talk. We can talk about Euron whenever, but yeah, I've, I've saved Euron uh, for the end. Uh, yeah, Dagon is, yes, obviously Dagon. Well, it's Lovecraftian, but originally it's, it's a rain god from Sumeria that was mistakenly associated with Oans, who was a fish-headed god. So a lot of people in Lovecraft's time thought of Dagon as a fish god, and that is why uh, he used Dagon in his Lovecraftian stories. All right. Let's see. Download you. Yeah, I should. I should. Um, <clears throat> that's right. How else are they going to maximize the profits of the AI art that they're... <laughs> thrown out exactly okay think about that brendan uh Rateni, about to go on tour of the channeled scablands with randall carson oh that's exciting the aftermath of the ice age comet impact going to be reading hamlet's mill to brush up on real life myth thank you david for opening my eyes to this at a song of ice and fire yeah well um i recommend yeah i've been watching a lot of youtube videos about geology and stuff lately i I don't want to get off topic but uh geology is fun yes it is and in fact honestly tim just trying to figure out if the iron islands might be a volcanic island chain or not led me down some crazy rabbit holes in the last couple weeks so i'll have more to say about that in the next ironborn video oh and thank you everyone for making the ironborn video a huge success very much appreciate that it's rocking and rolling so thanks a lot um oh but okay i got you long the lunk All right, so, and there was one other topical PayPal came in yesterday. Yes, two very generous PayPal, so thank you both. Estella says, just started to watch the Ironborn video, and as somebody who loves Vikings and pirates, and has just recently started getting into Lovecraft, I am just so excited. So right on cue, yes, thank you guys for... Your enthusiasm and appreciation for the Ironborn video. Had a lot of fun making it. Was talking about it for weeks. You guys see why. Um, great stuff. Just great material. So, did you have any? Um, I've consulted with you, Tim, throughout this whole Ironborn drafting process. And uh, I'll definitely give you a nice shout out during the Deep Ones video. But did you have anything to add to what was in the Ironborn video that didn't make it in there that should have? I don't know. And any thoughts that it jarred loose or. Well, if you saw my comment that I left when I was talking about how going through the Zothic legend cycle thing that I'm doing on my own channel, where uh, we have the, the main crux of the story is these Pacific islands are the remains of a once sunken continent that was once there that sat between North America and Asia. So the more I've been reading that and then coming back to Song of Ice and Fire when it comes to things like the Stepstones, but then also the Iron Islands, the Thousand Islands and all the other things, like the idea of sunken continents and just like these being the remains of something that were once attached to the mainland are just starting to make more and more sense to me. And because George is drawing, just like with uh, when he's drawing off of Carter and Duralith and Lovecraft, and then all three of them are drawing off of the Atlantis myth, the idea of a once sunken continent, but there are still little remnants around around that. And, and But we have all this lost history and we're not sure exactly what happened, just some cataclysmic event, and now they're separated. 
And then, of course, there's this whole thing that you told me about where the uh, the what's it called the the trapezohedron, the this <clears throat> magic meteor stone. stone is moved around from continent to continent where it tends to sink continents. And so, <clears throat> and not to get into the whole detail of it, but basically, guys, the more I look into this, the more it seems like the sea stone chair is not from a shy but rather from under the sea. Uh, I used to lean more in one direction, and now I think I'm leaning in the other direction. And it's interesting, Tim, that you know we've done all this work with Azor High and meteors and comets and all this stuff, and then here we are diving into the Squisher stuff, but it turns out the deep ones in the Squishers and Cthulhu are all connected to alien intelligence coming to Earth on comets, the sinking of land, like... All the stuff that we already had associated with the hammer of the waters and the meteor apocalypse, the deep ones are also tied to all that stuff. So now we got to think about like, did the deep ones have some sort of part to play in the long night disaster? Or is this all just kind of like parallelism and George being inspired? Uh, you know, like, okay. So when George is inspired by a story, sometimes he splits the idea. So, Tim, your camera's vibrating violently. Is your cat doing that, or what's going on? I'm going to get a Yeah, Damon's, <laughs> Damon's making his presence known. <laughs> I don't want to give anybody motion sickness. Can you, um, <laughs> can you get him to stop? All right, Damon, let's go. go down. It's, it's nuts. Go. It's like, it's like, let's <laughs> do this. Um, anyway, uh, what were we just talking about? Chug my memory. I completely just, it just flew out of my head. Tim, I'm asking you, what was I just talking about? Oh, well, we were talking about uh, the deep the deep ones and did they have a role Thank in the you. long yes. night? Yes, yes, working memory, ADHD. It's a real, it just disappears. Yes, yeah, so all that we have to consider, is there some deep one or squisher aspect to the actual disaster? You know, we've talked a little bit about were the Great Empire of the Dawn messing around with Deep Ones? Did the, you know, is that alien rock, are we supposed to think about that as Deep One Cthulhu magic that corrupted the Bloodstone Emperor? Hard to say. Oh, I remember what I was talking about. I was saying that when George is inspired by a story, he will take the idea and split them out, okay? Like, for example, the men of Ib are the frog people in Lovecraft Land. So mm -hmm. what... George did is he made frog people who are the Cranog men and he took the name men of Ib and applied it to the hairy men. Okay. So like you can see both the name and the concept make its way into ice and fire, but in different places. And so with the deep ones and the meteors and all that, the deep ones and the squishers in ice and fire, they might not be associated with calling the comet or anything like that. It could be that George's, taking these ideas from Lovecraft and putting them in different places. We have wizards that call comets like the Bloodstone Emperor, and we have Deep Ones and Squishers and stuff who worship, you know, meteorites and weird idols and stuff. But we do have to kind of just open the whole thing and consider, uh, like I said, if the Deep Ones or their gods or whatever, I think what, you know, had a role in all this, I think what George is trying to imply, Tim, is that the moon meteors and the red comet, there's like an alien intelligence associated with it. And that might be part of what animates things like the others or the deep ones. What do you think about that? Yeah, because, I mean, just not to give too much away, because it is going to be a plot point in the next uh, Zothic legend story that I do. But what is a revealed is that the deep the deep ones do move the black stuff, this trapezohedron the chaos stone it first starts off in atlantis and atlantis sinks uh then moves on to volusia in the tales of cull which is robert e howard conan tales you have the serpent men of volusia and i've, I've mentioned many times like the connection like oh serpent men of volusia dragon lords of valyria well volusia is destroyed in a doom of valyria type situation then the black stone moves on to ancient egypt but egypt falls and there it stays because uh, it's obtained by the pharaoh Nefren Ka, and it's entombed with him. So he dies, he's mummified, he's buried in a tomb, and the, with all his worldly possessions like pharaohs are. And then from there it stays because 
the deep ones just don't seem to be able to get it back because you know they could probably get through the river nile but then then you're trudging through a desert which is a tall order for fishmen so there it stays but the point is is that up up until it gets <laughs> up until it gets into the hands of this pharaoh the deep ones are the ones moving it around from place to place to place and every place that it ends up with ends up having this gigantic catastrophe either the land itself is destroyed or a dynasty ends. just something catastrophic happens. And I think George like is playing around with that same idea here with these meteors, like something is sort of bringing them here. They aren't just, it doesn't seem like these are random strikes. Like this is, seems to be done being done with purpose, but we can't say for sure because like George has said, we're never going to see literal gods on page. All we can do is just feel that influence, the occasional hand going through the ether. Yes, I think that is right. And I think that... Um... Oh, man, I've got so many thoughts. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> that, I think that that is right. And I think that... Um... Oh, God, you said something that gave me a thought, and then now it's lost. Uh, what did you? What was the? What is the thing you said right before your last? Uh, that deep ones moving. Uh, oh yes. Moving okay. The so and, the doom that came to random. Sarnath. So there's these two ideas that are similar. Um, in the story that you're talking about, the deep ones are moving around this black stone, and it seems to be bringing destruction to various places as it moves around. Then in the the doom that came to Sarnath, of course. Sarnath is wiped out, and a thousand years later, the only thing, the only evidence that it ever existed is the toad, the, the black toad idol sitting in the marshes where the city used to exist. And so when, when you read about the first men or whoever finding the sea stone chair on the shores of Old Wick, it's very similar. It's Ooh. like, oh, was there an entire civilization that used to be here that got wiped out? Or did the Deep Ones move this idol around? Uh, and partially destroy the Iron Islands in the process? Is it associated with a destruction of the Iron Islands? Like, you can see here how understanding the Lovecraftian context for uh, the sea stone chair sitting on the shores of Old Wick adds a lot. It implies mm -hmm. that there has been destruction here or might be more destruction here or both. So, yeah. Good stuff, Tim. That was a, that was a good job of... Uh, Teasing, but not giving away. So let's get into the sigils now that we have talked about squishers and deep ones a little bit just to kind of get the juices flowing, you know, get the digestive squisher enzymes. Uh, oh, that's gross. Sorry. Sorry. That's how it works, though. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll go to Harlaw Island first. It's on the right. Harlaw is the wealthiest island. Tim, and here I will lean on you for your notes and your sort of overview stuff here. Um, we'll, basically, I want to do like the, the practical plot overview layer and then, and then the sort of symbolism layer if we can. So Harlaw okay. is the richest island and it, of course, is ruled over. Let me zoom in here. By the size of House Harlaw and all of its many offshoot Houses, and then we've got Volmark, and uh, also House Stone Tree here. But the rest is all Harlaw scythes. So go ahead and uh, give me what you got on uh, House Harlaw. So yeah, Harlaw, House Harlaw is the wealthiest family. They're the closest ones to being able to rival the Greyjoys. Uh, they're also the Ironborn family with the most branch families. So House House Good Brother has a number of branch families, but. Not as many as Harla. They have five, and they have five holdings all throughout the island of Har of Harla. So our main branch is at Ten Towers, and that's currently under ruled by Lord Roderick, who is Roderick the Reader. And then there are four branch houses: uh, Harridan Hill, which is currently with Borum in the Blue. Uh, there's the Tower of Glimmering with Hotho Humpback. There's Grey Garden, that's presided by Sir Harris Harla, the Knight of Grey Garden. Uh, he's Roderick's heir, and he is the one with the Valyrian steel sword, Nightfall. And then finally, there's Harlaw Hall, which is uh, under Siegfried Silverhair. Here you can see uh, Harris Harlaw with Nightfall. And uh, this is uh, Gwyneth, Roderick the Reader, Alanis Harlaw, Asha, Greyjoy, but 
course, you know, Harlaw. And then, uh, again, Harris on the right there. This art is by Miles Toyne on Tumblr. And here, of course, the Harlaws, they don't just read books. They're ironborn. They'll go, they'll go mm-hmm. reaving and stuff, too. I just found this art last night, Tim. Isn't this amazing? This is by um, Lucas Jakulski. So, yeah, pretty awesome. dope. Yeah, the peacocks. Yeah, so- do, the peacocks are out of place. So, the peacock. Which um, which branch is that? That is Grey Garden. Yeah. So, do you know the story behind the peacock? Uh. Hmm. Is it given anywhere? I think we'd have to look at uh, Harris and who his mother is, because. Because he is a knight, which is pretty rare for Ironborn. Ah, good um, point. Let's look it up. I found that there's also a battle of Harlaw. House it, Serret is from his mother. So House Serret is a Westerlands house from Silver Hill. Ah, interesting. Silver Hill. It's a lot of interesting silver symbolism that we're going to talk about. So there you go. He is. That's why he's a knight. He's, you know, it's a Greenlands tradition that he follows because his mother is from the Greenlands. So, yeah, the, the Reaper, Sigil, and this Peacock. It is a little bit of narrative tension there. <laughs> <laughs> um, peacock's associated with Argus in Greek mythology. And what's Argus's story? I don't remember. And yes, chat, I am looking for you to help today. There is, the sigils are like treasure chests of small references and details. And there's no way I'm going to catch it all. So definitely you guys have your thinking caps on. Be looking at these sigils hard and thinking about any related ideas because we might find some great discovery. So Argus works for, oh, oh, Argus of the many eyes. Argus panopsis. Oh, that's, and so Argos stone skin. That legend is based on Argus, and basically he guarded uh, Europa, the cow, or Io. Sorry, Io. Yeah, it was Io, right? They both they both got turned into cows and chained to it. They're always chased by Zeus. You know, Zeus is chasing all the goddesses, and they got to <laughs> turn into animals to hide. Yeah, um, that doesn't change Zeus's mind. Even when they turn into animals. They'll just turn into an animal, too, and keep going. So I'm just trying to think of what that could have to do. Well, I'm gonna, I'll put a pin in that. Argonauts. Jason and the Argonauts. Yeah, it was Io. Basically, the Io story is a good mythical astronomy story. Because you've got, uh, you know, the goddess who's a cow tied to a tree. So it's like Earth goddess, cosmic axis symbolism. And then Defender is this giant with many eyes. And uh, he's slain by Hermes, I believe it is. Yes, Io, like Jupiter's moon. Exactly. Anyway. So the Harlaw, like I was saying, the scythe of Harlaw does complement the Reaper symbolism of the Lord Reaper of Pike. So between these two places, you can see there's a common cultural idea and actually the oldest the oldest keep of the Harlaws is Harlaw Hall and there's I did some word translation here Tim I've been looking up names so Harlaw the word Harlaw means army hill or the state army stationed on a hill okay so the Harlaw Hmm. They live at Harlaw Hall and Harridan Hill. So you can see that George obviously knows what Harlaw means. And he's he's sort of doubling up. It's like, yeah, this is the hill where the army st- is stationed. Hill. Harlaw Hill or Harridan Hill. So Roderick means famous power. And the Rick in Roderick is similar to Elric, which is like wise ruler. Okay, so Roderick is famous power, powerful, famous ruler. Similar idea. So Roderick Harlaw, it's a very kingly name. And in fact, Harlaw Hill, or Harlaw Hall rather, is a Dawn Age 
castle. It goes back to the as old times as anyone can remember. It was the original seat of the Harlaws. And basically, um, there was a fellow named Theomor Harlaw who built ten towers. And that's where the now uh, where Roderick the Reader is and the official seat of House Harlaw is. So they have moved. Much like on Driftmark, how Corlys Velaryon built High Tide because the old castle Driftmark was mad drafty and stuff. That's what they said. Harlaw Hill, very damp. Harlaw Hall, rather, very damp. And so they went and built Ten Towers, and it's much nicer. And Theomore, of course, Theo means God. More means more or like higher. So Theomore is like God on high. And again, Harlaw, Army Hill or Army Station. Um, so you get the idea, like, it's not a super deep meaning here. It's just George giving these names to an old house so they sound kingly. These are kingly names with a lot of power and regard. Uh, that's that's kind of what I took away from it. What do you think of that, Tim? Yeah, because when it comes to Theomore and the building of the Ten Towers, like it says that he ended up with ten because he was a changeable man. So it sounds to me like this. You could almost imagine this is a guy who couldn't settle. Like maybe there was only supposed to be meant to be one tower. Then one was finished. He's like, nah, I don't like it. Let's try it. Right. They're way. all in. They're in different <laughs> styles, and he has like six wives. So it's like, yeah, this guy's indecisive. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how he ended up with ten. And then they just connected them with bridges. But I guess if you have the pa- if you have the power and the money to keep building like that, more power to you. So. <laughs> And then, yeah, so with House Harla, it's also important to note that uh, they are connected to the Greyjoys because Lady Gwyneth, Roderick's sister, is the wife and now widow to Balon Greyjoy. So she is the mother to Asha and Theon. And their support is split because the other thing I was doing is, since since I'm cosplaying in Euron and I got to keep track of who these people support it, all these families who who support it, Euron, the one, the, the true king of the Iron Islands, and who support it, the, who support it, Vic and Asha, uh, with the Harlaws, the support is split, because uh, Roderick supports Asha, uh, Hotho Humpback initially supports Victarion, but he's a bit of a schemer, um, he tries to get Vic on his side by offering up his daughter as a potential bride, but then he's really quick to switch to Euron. And then when Harris Harlaw, uh, because Sir Harris is made a lord of Greyshield after taking the Shield Islands, Otho now thinks that 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 makes him the new heir to the Ten Towers and the main branch. And the reality is, well, the but Harris obviously isn't going to be able to hold the shield islands none of the guys that you're on gives these islands here are going to be able to hold them it's all a means of undermining his political opponents he's taking away roderick's heir and giving him an island it, it seems like a gift it seems it seems like a, a title it seems you know it seems like he's trying to win support from them but really it's it's all taking away roderick's heir and undermining harlaw support and harlaw power so yeah you think of the scene where uh, roderick sort of challenges Euron. And uh, it's a tense moment because Roderick has a lot of power, even with your, and that's why Euron is making a point of trying to pick off his allies. Like Roderick the Reader is a major force to be reckoned with in the Iron Islands. And he's probably, that's probably going to be relevant, I would think. Um, Because if you think about the politics of the Iron Islands, there's not many people opposing Euron. Like he's got damp hair chained up in the front of his boat. Victarion's off in Slaver's Bay, and Euron is pretty much unopposed other than that. The only resistance that he has still among the Ironborn is Roderick the Reader. Uh, And he, of course, was just brought a few pages from Fire and Blood, um, the the in-world book of Fire and Blood, which has like the very deepest, dankest dragon secret lore out there. So there could even be something that Roderick the Reader knows about dragons that could come up and be important uh, to somebody if he becomes an ally, you know, to Danny or, or someone in the future. So definitely keep your yeah. eye on Roderick the Reader. And Tim, I have the quote about the seat of Roderick the Reader on House Harlaw, and it's very interesting. So let me just read this. Some of the sales... Um, oh, no. Let's see. Uh, okay, I've got two quotes. So one is um, Victorian looking at all the boats assembling on Old Wick. 
Some of the sails bore devices from the other islands, the Blood Moon of Winch, Lord Good Brother's Banded Black Warhorn, Harlaw's Silver Scythe. Only the Lord Harlaw displayed the Silver Scythe plain upon a night black field as it had flown in the dawn of days. Roderick called the reader, Lord of the Ten Towers, Lord of Harlaw, Harlaw of Harlaw. Titles, titles. Um, so here's the high seat. It says, Lord Roderick's high seat was vacant. Two scythes of beaten silver crossed above it, so huge that even a giant would have difficulty wielding them. Asha had oft seen him reading on his high seat beneath the silver scythes. He would listen to each case as it was laid before him, pronounce his judgment, and read a bit while his captain of guards went to bring in the next supplicant. So, much like Lord Eddard, you know, you can see the role of the High Lord is judge and executioner here. So you've got this guy sitting in judgment with size above him. It's the giant size that's interesting. For once, the size of the scythes. For, on one hand, it's a lot of silver. Just like, it's kind of ostentatious to have these gigantic silver blades. Like, whatever, okay. And then... One wonder, just like, wh where did this tradition come from? Like, you know, men used to be taller in ancient day or whatever, but like, much kind of like the great swords. Why do so many Westerosi walk around with six foot long swords that would really only be effective in the hands of somebody like Gregor Clegane or bigger? It, it, <laughs> are these like, did there used to be giants, Tim? I think so, because... <laughs> A lot of the Ironborn, like, when we think of the Ironborn, like, there's always tends to be a lot of sons, um, a lot of children. Like, like they seem to be, like, a very virile people. And I, so I think the intention is that ancient Ironborn probably, in that, in that same sense, were probably taller, bigger, stronger men. And then over time, as they've uh, had to make deals, make alliances with the Andals and First Men and stuff like that, and start marrying into... Greenland families, as, the, as they would say, that's when the bloodline starts to get diluted and you start ending up with uh, these smaller, more normal-sized people. So the chat is, is popping right now. And I, I do think there might... And of course, when we say there used to be giants, obviously there are still giants. We're talking about something more like humans. Possibly just the green men, Tim. Um, mm -hmm. They could be the giant humans that we're looking for. The answer is yes, probably, actually. Uh, but the chat says, <laughs> um, they're all compensating. The Ironborn with the big size and the names. It's like, it's like somebody finding, uh, you know, the jacked up uh, trucks and cars and shit. Be like, were there giant people? Be like, nah, they just liked really big tires and stuff. Um, and then somebody else was saying, silver scythes uh, for cutting ghost grass. Yeah. And somebody else was saying, you know, a silver scythe would be, that's, that's a ceremonial item. That's not, you wouldn't really make a scythe out of silver. And that's obviously true. So, yeah, the first men were tall, maybe very tall. And Harrenhal was built on a giant scale, but that was built recently. So that's got nothing to do with giant people. And that just shows you that just because stuff is big doesn't mean giants. Sometimes people like to make stuff bigger. We make statues of people, but they're 20 feet tall. The Egyptians love to do that. So, yeah. How can they reap but not sow? You know, that's a good question, James Shepard. Um, that's where the stealing comes in. Other people sow, and then the ironborn come and reap. That's, that's how that works. So, mm. yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So, let's say, okay. So, Harlaw, uh, and then, yeah, that's pretty much all I had on a Harlaw. Oh, no. Battle of Harlaw. That's right. Uh, sorry, behind the scenes. Okay, here we go. Battle of Harlaw. It's a Viking battle. Before being united as a country, the various regions of Scotland were divided by centuries of bitter rivalry between the different ethnic groups and kingdoms. The western seaboard of the country, influenced by Gaelic Viking culture, owed allegiance to the Lord of the Isles. And that's who I was talking about, that kingdom of the Isles on the Hebrides. While the northeast region... Uh, regionally, uh, traditionally formed part of the ancient Pictish kingdom. Safe to say that the clans of the West Coast did not always see eye to eye with those of the Northeast. The latest feud concerned, concerned Donald, Lord of the Isles, having fought for control of Ross. 
a large region of northeastern Scotland, or northern Scotland, now planned to strike south into the Moray, into Moray, towards Aberdeen, along with 10,000 of his clansmen. So, forewarned of Donald's advance, <clears throat> Alexander Stuart, Earl of Mar, hastily assembled a force from the local clans, including the Irvings, Leslies, blah, 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 Morays, Stirlings. Mar Mar's force is said to have numbered only around 1,500 men, although in reality it was probably much larger, including a substantial number of well-equipped mounted knights. Holding his knights as a cavalry reserve, Mar organized his spearmen into battle formation to face the advancing islanders near the town of Inverur Inverurri. Sorry, on the morning of 24th July, 1411. So 1411, that's where we are. The Islanders launched charge after charge against the close-packed ranks of Mar's spearmen, but failed to break their ranks. Meanwhile, Mar led his cavalry into the main body of Donald's army, where the Islanders thrust their dirks into the soft underbellies of the horses, stabbing the knights as they fell. By nightfall, the dead littered the field. Exhausted, Mar and the survivors of his army rested and waited for the battle to resume the following morning. But with the dawn, they found that Donald had left the field, retreating back to the Isles. So, basically, it kind of feels like Asha Greyjoy's attack on the Wolfswood, on Deepwood Mott, where the iron, there's men from the islands, they're trying to take a chunk of the mainland. And so your, your mainlanders have to repel them. And you get these fights in the woods, and, uh, you know, different kinds of forces clashing with knights versus these island barbarians or whatever you want to call them so pretty interesting that's the battle of harlaw i don't even know why it's called the battle of harlaw the word harlaw isn't in this narrative anywhere but probably something that george is aware of he loves this medieval history and so that's probably where the name harlaw comes from just uh sort of enhancing the the viking history feel of uh, the iron islands if you will pretty cool right yeah, and George does make it a point with his Harlaw to state that all the other uh, houses on Harlaw, House Kenning, House Meyer, Stone Tree, Voldemort, that they were all once bitter rivals to the Harlaws before eventually becoming vassals to them. Mute. Mute. You, you were muted the whole time. Yeah, you got to wave your arms too and say it. I was just talking <laughs> so loud I didn't even hear. Um, I've got Tim on a speaker here, but like quiet so it doesn't feed back into the microphone. Uh, in any case, uh, we have to remember that like we think mostly in large kingdoms, the conquest of large kingdoms. But George is, of course, taking things back to the time of small clans and tribes. And he's, you know, Westeros has seven kingdoms now. It used to have a thousand kingdoms. And that's, that's kind of what I was saying about the first men, too, is we shouldn't think about the first men migrating across the Arm of Dorne as this giant, like Moses in the Exodus. I don't think it was like that. I mean, maybe there's a couple of big migrations in there, but we're given the idea that it's over centuries people are you know just migrating in, drifting in. So the same thing on the Iron Islands. Like, at one point, yeah, you had... And when we get into the mythology of the Ironborn, it talks about that, like, oh, at times they're unified, and they forbidden from killing each other and at different times all the captains and kings warred on each other so that's what we're seeing here it's like at times there was these little wars of consolidation on each island and so the harlaws they rule harlaw isle because before the Greyjoys even like ruled all of the ironborn probably you know they're out conquering their neighbors essentially so it's cool that george puts that little granular history into all these islands here <laughs> Harrison Grant Williams. Maybe you've already touched on this, but why would the Greyjoy words be, we do not sew? Are they that concerned with clothing and fabric? <laughs> <laughs> that's why they, that's why they're, they're poor. They're just wearing rags all the time because they won't, they refuse to repair their clothing. <laughs> Very wasteful. They don't believe in upcycling. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's move on from Harlaw to Volmark. Okay. And House Volmark, still on Harlaw Island. Uh, there's not any art of Corn Volmark or anybody else, but of course, uh, this, and this will get into the symbolism first, 
But, oh yeah, and by the way, the, the symbolism of Harlaw is really just about, like I said, the scythe. It's a complement to the idea of a Lord Reaper of Pike. So it just builds the, the larger picture of the Grim Reaper, the Ironborn are agents of death. They, they don't sow, but they reap, they come and steal. It's, it's not even deep. It's, it's pretty basic. So that's why I didn't dwell on it. But just that's what the side is about. It's just a compliment to the Lord Reaper idea. So with Volmark, their sigil is a black Leviathan on gray. Now, the word Leviathan can mean different things. Um, it basically means sea monster. And so in Ice and Fire and also in the real world, very large whales or squids could be a leviathan. And you see whales especially in Ice and Fire. They talk about the gray leviathans and this and that leviathan sound. That's all about whales. However, in the Bible, of course, the leviathan is a sea dragon, a multi-headed sea dragon in some cases. And so this artwork here is a famous, it's a woodcut actually, by Gustave Doré, who's very famous and has done illustrated many scenes out of the Bible, Garden of Eden stuff, Lucifer, really cool things that I've used a lot. This is a very famous work. So this is Yahweh slaying the Leviathan, okay? And it's Yahweh is a storm god, loosely speaking, uh, has roots in storm god mythology. Like, don't... There's debates about it, but he is definitely storm-associated. And he picked up ideas from other storm gods. So, storm god slaying the dragon is chaos comp mythology. I've got a whole stream about chaos comp mythology. It's in tons of different cultures. It's it's all about the day-night cycle and various things. We don't need to get into that. But, House Volmark. It's basically, this is all about Naga the sea dragon. All right. So, the Grey King slew Naga. Naga's the first sea dragon. That is just another inf- instance of the storm god and the dragon. And the Grey King is basically like the storm god here. <clears throat> and that works because the Grey King, of course, he taunts the storm god, but then what? Takes his fire, possesses his fire. So now he is the master of the storm. Grey King also parallels Durin God's grief, the storm lord, who, again, Durin wars against the wind and sea gods, but then ends up calling himself the Storm Lord, almost as if he's taken their power. Uh, Euron Greyjoy, who echoes the Grey King, says, I am the Storm. Okay, so Grey King slaying the Sea Dragon is another Storm versus Dragon echo. And this is why, uh, this is kind of how this works, okay? The, the, the whole sigil symbolism. So George sets up House Volmark. He gives them the Leviathan. I, this sigil is great because it's a, it's a whale, but it's a kind of a scaly looking whale. So it splits the difference. And in fact, I think the person who did this sigil was probably inspired by this Gustave Doré artwork. You can see it looks almost exactly the same. So he splits the difference between a whale and kind of a sea monstery thing. All right. So what's the major, Tim, what is the major story about House Volmark in the story? Well, the current one is that House Volmar claims descent through Black Heron, through the female line. But, uh, and it's said that uh, before the King's Moot, they say that like, the current Lord of Volmark, Lord Marin Volmark, has a rightful claim to the Sea Stone Chair. But this usually tends to go unnoticed by Ironborn, which is more of a patriarchal society, that they're not really paying much attention to the female line. But for Euron, He's still lending credence to it because he names Lord Marin Volmark, who's very young. I think he's only like nine or ten years old. He's he's a boy lord, but Euron names him Lord of Greenshield. But again, he's doing this for the exact same reasons that he names Sir Harris Harlaw as a lord and why he names Newt the Barber and Andric the Unsmiling. This is all ways of getting rid of possible opponents because of Volmark's uh, ties to black heron and uh, a possibility of uh, of claiming the sea stone chair by connection to house whore and and that dynasty of ironborn kings and so here of course is the burning of heron hall by mark simonetti 
And this, uh, this is what Tim is talking about. Black Heron Whore is the name. He was of the black blood line of House Whore, and that's H-O-A-R-E, like Whorefrost. That's more others' symbolism, by the way. And so, um, yeah, he was the, the black line. Remember, Aegon was like, you know, your line will cease to exist. The famous words before he burned Heron Hall. So the Volmark, basically, Corn Volmark claimed to be a descendant of him. And I've actually got the passage here to read this. So, Aegon Targaryen and his sisters paid little heed to the Iron Islands in the immediate aftermath of Heron Hall. They had more pressing concerns and powerful foes to defeat on every hand. Left to fend for themselves, the Ironborn immediately fell to fighting. Corin Volmark, a minor lord on Harlaw, was the first man to claim the kingship. His grandmother had been a younger sister of Harwin Hardhand. On the basis of that tie, Volmark declared himself the rightful heir of, quote, the Black Line. And that's the black blood of Hair in the Black. <clears throat> on Old Wick, two score priests gathered beneath the bones of Naga to place a driftwood crown on one of their own, a barefoot man called Lodos, who claimed to be the son of the living son of the drowned god. By the way, Tim, Lodo means mud. Means water, some sort of water and mud mixture when the ground turns to a mud slide. Lodo and Lodos, that's what they mean. So Lodos, the, the thrice drowned. It's, it's a great name for an ironborn prophet. It's like mud, the prophet. <laughs> um, so then it says, other claimants soon arose on Great Wick, Pike, and Orkmont. And for a full year or more, their followers fought each other by land and sea. Aegon the Conqueror put an end to the fighting in 2 AC when he and Balerion descended upon Great Wick, accompanied by a vast war fleet. The Iron Men collapsed before him. Corn Volmark died at the Conqueror's own hand, cut down by Aegon's Valerian steel blade, Blackfire. On Old Wick, the priest King Lotus turned to his god, calling on the Krakens of the Deep to drown Aegon's warships. When the Krakens failed to appear, Lotus filled his robes with stones, walked into the sea to take counsel with his father. Thousands followed him. Their bloated corpses washed up on the shores of the isles for years to come. Though the priest's own body was not amongst them. Dun, dun, dun. On Great Wick and Pike, the surviving contenders, the king on Orkmont having been slain the previous year, were quick to bend the knee and do homage to House Targaryen. But who would rule them? On the mainland, some urged Aegon to make the ironborn vassals to Lord Tully of Riverrun. Others suggested the islands be given to Casterly Rock, and a few went so far as to implore him to scour the isles clean with dragon flame. Okay, so let me explain what we just read. Because it is symbolism. All of this is trying to tell us that the slaying of the sea dragon is a moon meteor landing. That is the secret here. And so, the reason why the Volmark is a black leviathan, that's a black sea dragon. It's telling you the sea dragon is a black meteor, a black dragon symbol. Like the number one symbol of the black meteor is a black dragon. So a black leviathan is just a black sea dragon. And the whole point, again, slaying the sea dragon, that's like slaying the moon from the sky. What do you get from that? You get the fire of the sea dragon, the moon meteor. Okay? So mm. this whole thing with Aegon descending on the Iron Islands, it's the same thing. What is Aegon? Riding a black dragon. Having a black dragon sword, which he kills Corn Volmark with. So it's just George piling black dragon meteor symbolism on top of each other. He's saying, Aegon, the dragon king, riding a black dragon, came and scoured the iron islands with fire. He burnt the black leviathan and he slayed him with his black dragon sword. So you should picture that as the black meteor falling on the iron islands, burning everything, and leaving behind the, the remnant the burnt remnant of the sea dragon, which is this black stone. That's what all this is about, the entire thing, the whole exchange. It's, it's literally riding in the POV of Aegon here. You are in the moon meteor POV. You get to the Iron Islands, you kill everything, you, you, you scour it with fire. Um, and then uh, who, is, who does get put in charge? Well, that, it's after this, that's when... Um... After everything goes down with Hair in the Black and the Volmark's claims are put down, that is when 
Aegon the Conqueror allows the Iron Islanders to be like, okay, have your little king's move, but you're not going to be naming a king. You're just going to be naming a lord. And that's when we get Vicon Greyjoy becomes the first Lord Reaper of the Iron Islands and Lordship of the Iron Islands becomes a hereditary position through the Greyjoy family from there on. There you go. And so, yeah. And, and that's sort of the timeline of it, too. So it that's giving you a clue about when the Greyjoys came to power um, mm -hmm. originally. It's like right after the Long Night, whatever the previous civilization is existing on the Iron Islands is wiped out by the meteors. And in the aftermath, you have the remnants of the Ironborn setting up their current culture where they are ruled by the Lord Reaper of Pike. So I will get into that in future Ironborn videos. But major clues here in that passage. Uh, so even the idea that um, the Lodos part, okay? So like, yeah, there's, there's, he's essentially like a gray king figure. He's wearing, he's the son of the drowned god. He's going in and out of the seas, wearing a driftwood crown. He's ruling on old wick. And uh, he also, that's showing you like the gray king weirwood culture comes to an end at the long night when the dragon scouring meteor comes to the iron islands. Like psh, then we're saying goodbye to that weirwood culture. And after that comes the Lord Reaper of Pike era. So timeline heresy. Oh yeah. Um, Volmark. So Mark is means borderland or border. Sometimes it's specifically like a forested border. So like Denmark, um, it means Dane border, essentially, because the marsh, there's a marshland and a forest land that separates Denmark from the continental Europe. And so that, that Dane mark is the, the borderland, and that became the name of the country. So drift mark, for example, is implying that it's the border between land and sea. And what do we have? We have Lord Valarion making a pact with the Merlin King and sitting in a driftwood throne. So this is this is a, a, a treaty that's happening across a border based on driftwood, and so driftmark. So volmark, the word vol, V-O-L, means will, as in voluntary or um, uh, convulsion, uh, evolve, I think, is, is the same word. Uh, it has to do with consciousness, um, intention, will, uh, consenting or not consenting, uh, let's see, benevolent is like a, is that's will. So if, if you're benevolent, you have a will, you're wishing someone well, right? So that's Vol. Mm -hmm. So Volmark is like the border of will or the border of intention. And so that it, it, I think what George is getting at here is Azor high stuff. Like the sea dragon, it's the place where Azor High crossed over. Like slaying the moon, bringing down the moon meteors allows Azor High to go into the weirwood net. And it was done intentionally, if you will. <clears throat> That's what I took out of it. But ch what is the chat saying about Volmark? It also means flight in French. Well, that could make sense since we're talking about. Um, all these clues about the sea dragon, Naga, which really was a, a flying moon rock, a flying dragon. So that could make sense as well. Driftwood border, drift mark, yeah. So, right, because the weirwoods are the border between life and death. So it's kind of like psychopomp stuff. Exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, volition, same thing. So yeah, will mark. I guess it's like the border between free will or not. You could even look at it that way. Uh, Volkwang is Freya's hall. Interesting. Border with the sky if Vol is flying. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. There Welcome was a super chat that went by that we missed. I'm just trying to find it. Can you scroll back and look at it? Or do you need me to scroll back? Uh, that's all I'm trying to find. It was some super chat. Oh, uh, here we go. From the Delphi Morphia. Does Gurm imply anything with the word play between whore, H-O-A-R-E for house whore, and whore, W-H-O-R-E, like a sex worker? Um, I Potentially so. 
there is, I think there is sex worker symbolism with the children of the forest and Nissa Nissa in the way that Azor High is essentially using them, potentially. Um, and there are several, we'd really have to go to all the scenes in the brothels and break down the symbolism. But I think it's something like that. And Night's Queen in particular is the frozen woman, if you will. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I hesitate to, to venture into that comparison without doing the research and knowing exactly. Like, I don't want to just guess about that, well, if you I, will, being a sensitive. I, have an, I do have an idea on that because it's, it's something I bring up in the it was it's in my Orkmont notes because that's where House Whores originally from. But uh, the whole black line of black hair. And so they are called that. Uh, it's it's uh, the the line of House Whores called black, uh, black of blood, black of eye, black of heart. And it's used as a way of denigrating them by the drowned priests after House Whore becomes the uh, next ruling dynasty after House Greyiron is taken down. And it's because House Whore uh, made, along with the other uh, Ironborn houses that they team up with, like the Drums, the Orkwoods, and the Greyjoys to take out House Grey Iron, uh, the Whores were also more willing to work with the Andals. And so House Whore is one of the first Ironborn houses to take Greenlanders to Bride. And the Drowned Priests, of course, have an issue with that. And that's why they start call it, saying that they have black blood because in their eyes, House Whore is marrying with foreigners and bringing foreigner queens into the Iron Islands when they take over. So I do think when when we're thinking Whore, it's a way of, in that sense, it is a way of denigrating the family because of their queens being seen as outsiders. I also think it's interesting that um, George is... Uh... Oh man, my brain today. Uh, the okay, so the black blood is is yet another. Um, I have a second thought, but I'll come back to it. The black blood is more of the moon meteor symbolism. So like the whole like who has black blood? It's dragons and resurrected people, and the bleeding stars are black stones. So black blood has always been a very important symbol of these bleeding stars that bring the darkness. Valerian steel swords are black, but tempered in blood. So they're black blood swords, okay? So Volmark, which has a black Leviathan and gets killed by a black sword and a black dragon, well, he's got the black blood. So it's, again, it's just layers of the same idea to sort of show you. And, and we, again, if the, if, the bleed, if the bleeding star, if meteors are called bleeding stars, Remember, the Bloodstone Emperor worshipped a black meteor. So, Bleeding Star, Bloodstone. But it's a black stone. So, George is really telling us, like, these moon meteors, they have black moon blood on them in a figurative sense. The moon is a goddess. It was destroyed in blood and fire. The pieces of its corpse are these black rocks. They are bloody stones, but they're black bloody stones. So, the black blood, it's a very important symbol and again, people who get burned with Relor magic, like Barrack, they have black blood too. So, um, now, as, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Okay, so as far as the Andals and the Faith and the Ironborn and the Iron Islands, Tim, it's interesting that, you know, the Vikings were swiftly converted to Christianity when mm -hmm. Christianity hit, uh, you know, Denmark and Norway and then Iceland. Like, so much so that most of the Icelandic sagas that we have from Snorri and other people, they're from, the t they're from like two or three hundred years after the Christianization of the Vikings. And thus, it is very hard to sometimes unpack the influences on Norse mythology. A lot of it has really been Christianized. It's like, wow, Odin, Odin sounds a lot like Jesus. Well, some of that is Proto-Indo-European connections. Some of that is the Christianization of Norse myth. And because we have limited sources for Norse myth that are older than Snorri, basically just pictures on rocks and runes, it's very hard to sort that out. Now, what's interesting, Tim, is that the Ironborn do not take well to Christianization, which is obviously the faith of the seven. 
Like they mostly keep it away and retain their culture. So it's kind of like George doing a sliding doors thing. It's like, what if the Vikings never became Christian, you know, or not very much. And then they become the Baltic States. What do you mean? Uh, well, as far as Christianization of Europe goes, the Baltics, like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they were the longest holds out, hold out. So they're the ones that kind of remain pagan the longest. As for the Norse, like, yeah, De uh, Sweden, right. Denmark, Norway uh, got Christianized very quickly. Iceland, Iceland held out and they remained pagan for a while after. They uh, Eventually it did happen, but like Iceland held out the longest, but still not as long as the Baltics did. They stayed pagan. They were some of the last European areas to become Christianized. So Martin Krog, uh, Squisher in the chat, is adding um, that the, the Volkwang, which is Freya's hall, it makes sense because she is the goddess of fate. So again, you see that will is being involved. She's the goddess of this afterlife. But she's the goddess of fate. So how do you get there? Like, it involves your free will or lack thereof because you're a slave to fate in some ways. So yeah, that that's that's cool. That that fits well. Uh, let's see. Martin is saying that Norway held out longer. Yeah, I could be the main th the main reason why. I've, honestly, my favorite a lot of my favorite stuff in Norse mythology comes from the Sami influence. And the Sami are basically descended of Siberian hunter-gatherers, which is the reindeer shamanism. Like a lot of the Odin mythology is reindeer shamanism. That comes from the Sami, not Proto-Indo-European. And that's why we don't find some of that stuff in the other branches of Proto-Indo-European. So I'm very interested in seeing a good unpacking of Norse myth that is looking for the reindeer shaman layer and trying to pull that apart from the Proto-Indo-European layer. I haven't seen anybody try to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe we'll get there on mythic concepts. Very similar to Lug fighting off Christianity from overtaking Ireland. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a problem all the pagans had. You know. <laughs> so, the missionaries, they are... Yeah. Uh, that's still a problem, or, actually. All right, so... Like the, I was say, the Christianization of the Rus and Russia basically goes with Orthodox Christianity over Islam because it still allows them to keep drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are some really good um, uh, documentaries on the Sami who are related to the Finnish and uh, Uralic peoples. Exactly right. That's right. The Uralic folklore is heavily influenced by the reindeer shamanism of the Siberian hunter-gatherers. Absolutely. Okay, going on. Ice and fire. So that's <laughs> Volmark. It's mostly moon meteor symbolism. That, that's kind of the deal. Um, next up is House Stone Tree. And let me just go back to the map real quick so we can remind us where we are. We're on Harlaw. We talked about all the Harlaws. Volmark is down there in the south. Stone Tree is right in the middle of the island. And you see the sigil. It's a stone tree. Tim, I've got no idea what that could mean. What does it mean, <laughs> Tim? Well, yeah, right there, uh, sto a stone tree. We talked extensively about how weirwoods never truly die. They they petrify. But there are no weirwoods on the Iron Islands. The soil is too loose and stony for them to take root. And yet... And yet, there is still no, so man, much. I don't weirwood. think any weirwoods can grow here, man. It's too stony. Yet, oh, not that stony. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, like it's it's another one of those weird those weird occurrences where, despite there being no weirwood trees on the Iron Islands, despite there not being very many trees, none left now in in the current story anyway, because they've all been cut down. Yet here they are in the Iron Islands, and. Uh, as for how stone tree, there's also the story, because um, we were talking about Naga and the great king slew Naga. The great king also slew Yig. Uh, Yig was a demon tree who fed on human flesh. And uh, according to legend, the great kings carved the first long ship from Yig's hard, pale wood. So it's also possible that how stone tree is, is invoking this other ironborn folklore of Yig, the demon tree. Yes, and so 
the cult- cultural anthropologist way that I explain this, as opposed to the like mythical astronomer way, is that so if if it's true that the Grey King made his ship from Weirwood, which seems to be, I mean, it's pretty friggin' solid theory. I've laid it out before. I will do it again in the next video if you're not familiar. But yes, the Vikings used to take their boats when they were done using them, flip them over, and use them to make a long haul. And the ribbing of the ship is what forms the beams and rafters. They also made long hauls with the same construction that they would make a ship with, but just inverted. And so their long hauls end up looking like upside down boats. So when there's all these passages comparing Naga's ribs to trees and pale trees and all this stuff, the mast of a ship, we're supposed to understand. If you have a weirwood arc, and it is an arc, Tim, it's huge, where the, the main ribbing of the boat is made of weirwood, at some point when you're done using it as a boat, you might flip it over and use the ribbing as the beams and rafters for the long haul, just as we... It makes more sense than using a skeleton. Although, actually... There are whale skeleton, whale rib huts made by Inuits and hunter-gatherers too. So that's also a thing, <laughs> making a long haul from like whale ribs. I've got pictures of that as well. Um, okay, so point is with House Stone Tree, this weirwood boat that got flipped over and made into a long haul, of course, will petrify after thousands of years. And I've got the quote about that uh, queued up here. And so then... Thousands of years go by, and what do you have? All you have is the stone ribs, but they are trees. So what George is doing is he's hiding a lost phase of weirwood worship on the Iron Islands. I was just alluding to it when I was saying, oh, Lodos represents the Grey King as a weirwood green seer. He dies or dis- you know, goes into the sea when the long night symbolism comes. Aegon comes to the island like a meteor and burns everything. Lodos drowns. So, similarly, what George is, he's showing us the Iron Islands, we're like, oh yeah, weirwoods don't grow here, they hate the old gods. But, in the most remote antiquity, their first drowned priestess has a weirwood staff. And their first king is sitting in a weirwood hall and on a weirwood throne with weirwood around his head. And then, we see, basically, it's a lost tradition. But George is giving us clues that the Ironborn have like cargo cult type memories of it. So they still use a driftwood crown. Well, what's that emulating? That's emulating the weirwood crowns that the old green seers used to wear. And the same thing with a driftwood throne over on the other side of the Westeros. I don't know why it's over there, but same thing with a stone tree, okay? House stone tree, it's basically like a vague memory. At one point, the ironborn used to understand that weirwoods did turn to stone. And that weirwoods would petrify and turn into stone trees. That has to be where the name comes from. But it's so long ago that people forgot. And so now it's mm-hmm. just a stone tree. So it's it's very... Um, it's symbolism, obviously, for the whole Naga's rib stuff. But I love the way that George is imagining it here. He's like, oh yeah, in days of yore, they would remember that Ig became a boat. And then the boat became a long haul that turn to stone, because weirwoods turn to stone. But he's acting as if the Ironborn have mostly forgotten that. And so you have a driftwood crown that they don't associate with weirwood, and maybe Galen Whitestaff's staff was weirwood, but maybe it was Naga's fang. You know, so it's really cool. It's like the fog of time descending over the real truth and leaving these little remnants. And how Stone Tree is just a huge one. Okay. Um, before we go on, there was there's a super chat, and then I think there uh, someone. It was a sh- oh a super sticker someone had left behind. Just want to make sure everyone. Michael James. Michael James. Thank yep. you. Thank you for the super sticker. Oh, I just want to point out because you sent the pear character. Um, the drink I'm having is Reading Draft Soda, and it is honey pear. So the pear. A bear, a bear. <laughs> he licked the. Okay, stop. I will stop. I will stop myself. Um. <laughs> we got to do a bear in the maiden fair cover. I, I need to do one. That's uh, okay. Didelphi Morphia. Did the ironborn ancestors used to swim the green sea in the weirwood net? Like they swam the water sea in the weirwood boats. Well, yes, 
basically. I mean, obviously it's all a metaphor, like the idea of a weirwood boat. It's telling you that the weirwood trees themselves are ships by which the green seers can sail the green sea. That's the point of the metaphor. That's why George made a weirwood boat. It's just telling you, like Bran and Bloodraven, they're using the weirwoods as ships to sail the river of time or the green sea. So it's a very consistent metaphor. As we know, a weir is a dam-like thing that regulates the flow of a river. So the river is the river of time. The weirwoods regulate the flow. You guys get that. So that's the whole point of the weirwood ship. So yes, the ancient ironborn used to swim the green sea in that sense. I believe so. <clears throat> Do you get blue lips if you eat White Walker? You can't eat White Walker, Martin Krog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't need to take a break to praise Garth. When Tim's around, I just lean off camera and let Tim talk and come back, and we don't we don't even slow it. Do you, you want to hear the music? Is that it? I'll give you the music at some <laughs> point if you want, but let's keep going because we're going slow. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Because yeah, we're we're still on how we're still on Harla. <laughs> um, Iceberg so, streams take a while, Tim. And if you do have to go at some point, it's fine. But uh, let's. Oh no, no, it. I'm good. Okay. Um, so the other big thing about House Stone Tree. Um, so they were the uh, Quellen Greyjoy, who is the father of Balon, Victarion, Euron. Uh, his first wife was a woman of House Stone Tree. She gave him three sons. Uh, two of them died as infants, but the eldest one, Harlan. Uh, he contracted grayscale, so he started turning into a stone man. Yes, and it is Har Harlan is Euron's first family kill. He's the one, he he goes in uh, the grayscale covered his mouth, so uh, he was breathing through his nose. Euron I have the quote. His nose. <laughs> I have the quote actually. Let oh, me read it to you, and then you can uh, you can break it down. So it says nine sons had been born from the loins of Quellen Greyjoy, the Lord of the Iron Islands, Harlan, Quentin, and Donal had been born of Lord Quellen's first life, a woman of the stone trees. Balin, Euron, Victarion, Euron, and Aeron were the sons of his second, a Sunderly of Saltcliff. For a third wife, Quellen took a girl from the Greenlands who gave him a sickly idiot boy named Robin, the brother best forgotten. Harsh. The priest had no memory of Quentin or Donal, who died as infants. Harlan, he recalled but dimly, sitting gray-faced and still in a windowless tower room and speaking in whispers that grew fainter every day as the grayscale turned his tongue and lips to stone. One day we shall go feast on fish together in the drowned god's watery halls, the four of us and Yuri too. So, this is a big part of my Grey King theory, Tim, uh, is mm -hmm. that essentially the, gray, the idea of the Grey King living a thousand years and turning gray, that's just Blood Raven sitting in that throne for another 900 <laughs> and turning into a petrified weirwood stone. Um, and I think that the lowest level of the crypts, of course, as we discussed, will have just that. The original Kings of Winter will be petrified green seers on stone thrones that are tree thrones. Um, and that that's what this is all getting at. Um, so here we have a stone tree turning into a statue with grayscale. So mm -hmm. that's pretty hot. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's just another version of a green seer a stone tree, okay, a tree person turning into stone. Uh, that's what the grayscale is about, at least on a symbolic level. So I know, I know there's a theory now that uh, you get grayscale on purpose to become a King of Winter statue so that you can wake up uh, for the long night and fight as a stone man. I don't think that's, I think that's too literal of an interpretation, <laughs> although I do like the overall video and theory behind that. I think this is the real truth. Is uh, Grey King, Green Seer, Stone Throne stuff. Um, yeah, so pretty cool. What do you th what do you think of the grayscale Grey Joy? What are your thoughts? Uh, it, well, I'm just thinking of the idea of someone purposely infecting themselves with grayscale. I mean, mate. I mean the the one positive, I guess you could say, from grayscale is that is, is that apparently it. At least from what we can gather, it seems to make you immune to being whited, which in a time of the long night, yeah, then grayscale would actually not be would actually be more of a strength than a curse. But at the same time, the downsides of grayscale seem to be way, way, way more numerous than any positive aspects that they could possibly have. 
especially too when we look into like what exactly happens to people with grayscale in the process as it gets worse and worse and worse. And then if you take that and you bring it back to its original Lovecraft tale, which is uh, out of the eons and what's happening to the people there with, who get cursed by the stone mummy and how <laughs> they're, they are just trapped inside their own bodies, feeling everything as their, as their skin and as their skin begins to petrify and their eyes and ears and everything close up. Like it's, it's, it's uh, I yeah. Uh, yeah, so it seems that's that's the main thing to me is like uh well the the stone men that we see are like going crazy. So that mm -hmm. no it could be that uh you know that that version of grayscale is a variant and that there's a different version where you don't go crazy or something. So I mean we should always be open minded. Um but I when you look at the uh the origin of grayscale, the Valerians versus the Roinar. Now Garen the the Garen the Great in a golden cage, like the Roinar are sea people, so they are green. They are our weirwood. In this metaphor, they represent the weirwoods. They are they worship their mother river, um, and uh, even the cage is weirwood symbolism. So then they're invaded by the dragon lords. That's just Azor Ahai going into the weirwood net, going into the sea. What does Azor Ahai do? He corrupts and burns everything, right? So what do the Valerians do? They burn the river. The river boils the Roinar in the river. Their own mother brought to a boil, kills them inside the river. This is Azor Ahai burning up the weirwood net, corrupting it, invading it. So what happens? Garen the Great, Garth the Green, if you will, in a golden cage, great, from the river rises the mists of grayscale. It's a curse inflicted upon the Valerians, and they then turn to stone. So if grayscale is symbolism... For green seers turning to stone on their thrones, perfect story. Azor High invades a weirwood net, burns and corrupts it, but then he's a green seer now, and so he's turning into a statue, and he's sort of trapped in that form. And then again, you go to the kings of winter, they have red swords across their laps. They're iron swords, but they've rested. So they're now red swords, or black and red swords, if you will. Perfect light bringer symbols. So you can see... This green seer that gets caught in the weirwood net and turns into a statue, whether you're talking about the first, like, King of Winter or the last hero, King of Winter, maybe, let's say, or the Grey King, like, this is an Azor high figure. And that's, that's, so it all, it all parallels and works pretty well. Um, real quick, I want to shout out uh, a YouTube channel in the chat. Michael talks about stuff. Uh, I definitely know some of you guys have seen his videos. He's a new channel. But he's, his, um, his videos are very thought-provoking, and he's working with a lot of uh, familiar symbolism that you guys have recognized. So why don't you guys go check his videos out and give him some subs and help get him over 1,000, because I think his videos are definitely uh, worth taking a look at. So um, it, one in particular about the making of the wall, he's talking about the weirwoods inside the wall. And while I can't say I agree with everything... I do like a lot of the ideas. And Wiz the Smith has been talking about weirwoods inside the wall for a long time. We've been talking about how the Night Fort probably predates the wall and that the location of the Night Fort weirwood is what determined the location of the wall and that it's very possible there are more of those organisms like the Black Gate in other locations under the wall and that this is kind of like the backbone of this hinge of the world. It starts with weirwood. So he's sort of taken that idea uh, and expanding on it. So check that out. Michael talks about stuff that's just, I mean, I could drop the link, but Michael talks about stuff. That's how you find it. So he's in the chat. Shout out, homie. I saw somebody on your channel going, you guys are overthinking this. Maybe a spade is just a spade. <laughs> I dropped a, I dropped a comment on there. I was like, honorary dislike, downvoter, courtesy <laughs> downvoter, something like that. <laughs> so that means you're, you're officially here, Michael. You're getting the, Maybe a spade is just a spade comments. Those are always fun. <laughs> Did you have anything to add about um, the whole petrified throne green seer? Th we've talked about it already, but... No, nah, we. I think we've covered everything there. <laughs> okay. And we'll come back to it more. Because yeah. the Grey King stuff is threaded throughout uh, the sigils. So. Okay, so Stone Tree... Um, oh, real quick. I did have the Blackwood... Quote, and this is worth reading. 
This is Jamie approaching Raventree Hall. Inside the castle walls, however, a bit of the forest still remained. House Blackwood kept the old gods and worshipped the first men as they had, as the first men had in the days before the Andals came to Westeros. Some of the trees in their godswood were said to be as old as Raventree's square towers, especially the heart tree, a weirwood of colossal size, whose upper branches could be seen from leagues away like bony fingers scratching at the sky. Tim, what do the weirwoods have against the sky? What are they trying <laughs> to do? I mean, the one at the night for it, it's reaching up for the moon as if to pull it into the well. What's going on? Somebody trying to use yeah. tree magic to harm the sky, Tim. Yeah, and that's a that's a recurring theme. Is that the we always get these uh, these symbols of the weirwoods being like hands trying to grip the moon and pull it down, or grip something in the sky and pull it down. And that's another big thing uh, that George drew from House of the Worms, which I did on my own channel. Uh, the same symbolism there, where the trees look like they're trying to grip the moon and pull it back down to earth. And you couple that with the fact that the uh, weirwoods are also constantly referred to as worms and serpents, and then also sometimes tentacles, and then that brings the Greyjoys back into this. And then again, like we're talking with Stone Tree, how Stone Tree was married into the Greyjoy house. Tim, <laughs> <laughs> what was that you just said? So you're saying George got all that language about the trees attacking the sky? That's that's from where? Which story? That's from House of the Worm. The weirwoods are very wormy and very tentacly. I mean, ridiculously so. We're hundreds of feet below the earth, and there's just root tentacles everywhere. It's a little much. I think Michael Talks About Stuff was wondering if, like, the core of the earth is just a ball of weirwood roots. <laughs> like, they all connect in the core, some shit like that. You know, the heart tree heart of the earth yeah when we get the description of blood raven's cave which seems to be like a center of the earth type deal it would seem that way with all the weirwood roots that are running through it yeah it really it's it's it also reminds you of um science fiction show that was canceled after two seasons where the planet had holes in it um made by the guy who did aliens why is my brain like this? <laughs> oh, somebody knows what I'm talking about. It'll somebody will say it. Really good show. It, with androids and artificial life and big serpents. Such a cool show. Raised by wolves. Thank you. Raised by wolves. Yes. Yes. I love his world building. I want to do like Prometheus. And the alien movie that came after that has a lot in common with the ideas and raised by wolves. And there's, I heard, I think he's making another alien movie and uh, I find, I hope he finally gets to whatever he's trying to say. Some interesting stuff going on. All right. Thanks chat. Appreciate y'all. So I'm going to continuing with the Blackwood quote. Uh, Jamie's in the solar, the bony fingers scratching at the sky. Okay. Blackwood solar was on the second floor of a cavernous timber keep. Blackwood Solar. Like, these sentences are bonkers, Tim. Forget about what it actually means. Blackwood's Solar was on the second floor of a cavernous timber keep. So, we've got the sun going into the cave of night. Okay, the solar mm -hmm. is in a cavernous timber keep. So, the sun is hiding in a cavern. George uses that language. The cave of night where the sun goes to hide. Black wood. This is the time when the trees have been turned black and corrupted. Here at a place where the weirwood is dead. Like, just, <laughs> and just exploding. And it's a timber keep. It's a cave that's a timber keep. So it's, again, the, this is a weirwood cave. Mm -hmm. it's one sentence. Just, yeah. this is like <laughs> heavily psychedelic writing to me. I just want to point yeah. that out. There was a fire burning in the hearth when they entered. In the solar, of course, there's a fire burning. So this is the sun. Remember, we are, we are in the chamber of the sun. The room was large and airy because it represents the air and the, out, like the entire like, universe. Um, uh, and it says, with great beams of dark oak supporting the high ceiling. 
So we've got the, the world tree holding up the sky. Woolen tapestries covered the walls and a pair of wide latticework doors looked out upon the God's word. Latticework. That is a word that implies the net of stars, like Indra's net. That's the lattice. So you look through the lattice work to see the God's wood. This is just... Oh, man. Like, my hair stands up reading this whole paragraph. Um, through their thick diamond-shaped panes of yellow glass... So, again, the lattice work of diamonds. That's definitely the net of stars. Diamond-shaped panes of yellow glass... Jamie glimpsed the gnarled limbs of the tree from which the castle took its name. It was a weirwood ancient and colossal, ten times the size of the one in the stone garden at Casterly Rock. So yet another stone tree idea tied to this dead weirwood, which will turn into a stone tree. The stone garden at Casterly Rock. It's a tree that grows inside of a rock. It's not really turned yeah. to stone, but it's called the stone garden because it's a garden inside of a stone. But it says stone tree. It's the same language. This, this tree was bare and dead, though. The brackens poisoned it, said his host. For a thousand years it has not showed a leaf. In another thousand it will have turned to stone, the maesters say. Weirwoods never rot. So, how did the weirwood get poisoned? The brackens. And... The Brackens, of course, their sigil is a fiery horse. So very much a meteor, Azor High symbol. And of course, um, the most famous Bracken of all is Bittersteel, who turned the horse into a dragon horse, a fiery dragon horse. So you get the fiery dragon horse poisoning the weirwood tree, and then now it's a dead tree, stone tree, and a black wood. <laughs> Great shit, Tim. Yep. So, we'll chase that with this quote from Bran, A Game of Thrones. You know which one this is going to be. To a boy, Winterfell was a gray stone labyrinth of walls and towers and courtyards and tunnels spreading out in all directions. In the older parts of the castle, the halls slanted up and down so you couldn't even be sure what floor you were on. The place had grown over the centuries like some monstrous stone tree. Maester Lewin told him once, and its branches were gnarled and thick and twisted, its roots sunk deep into the earth. So Winterfell itself represents a stone tree. And Bran, obviously this is foreshadowing for him becoming a green seer. He's climbing above. He feels like the Lord of Winterfell. He can see everything, etc., etc. He's perching like a raven on the on the you know on the battlements. But yeah, Winterfell is a gray stone tree. It's also a labyrinth, so that suggests that there's a monster like the Minotaur inside. That's Azor Ahai, trapped, mm -hmm. you know, inside the stone tree. Um, and, of course, the root zone of Winterfell's stone tree is the crypts. What do we find in the root zone of the Weirwoods? We find green seers on thrones. So you can see why I think the lowest levels of the crypts should have green seers on thrones. It's because Winterfell is implied as a Weirwood cave, the whole thing. Those crypts, as originally that was a weirwood cave, right? I mean, does anyone doubt that? I don't think so. No. Your thoughts, Tim? No, I think... Um, so going back with the stone tree and blackwood tree, I think that is more evidence, too, that uh, the idea that the Iron Islands were once connected to the mainland. Um, oh, really? Now, because you kind of... Well, well, at first, it, at first, it can be like, well, the Iron Islands were also the kings of the Isles and the Rivers when House Hair and the Black and House Hor when they took take over the Riverlands, um, and then people like some of the chat has been asking, like, well, you know, all this deforestation in the Iron Islands because they cut down all the tr all their own trees to build ships, and that's why they now have to raid the Greenlands because they don't have any more trees of their own. Well, if we think if the Iron Islands were supposed to be uh, were supposed to be islands, and if they're supposed to be volcanic islands, Sora runs in the face of that because volcanic islands tend to actually be more fertile. Where, but the Iron Islands aren't. Like it's it there's the sto the soil's loose and stony. So the impression I get is that the forests that were on the Iron Islands, it's probably nothing short of a miracle that they were there in the first place which probably means that they were once connected to the mainland. And then after 
whatever happens to the Iron Islands to sink that and leave these remnants has just ruined any chances of new trees ever growing, probably because of saltwater tidal waves leaching into the soil. And that's what's making it so, so poor, so poor for harvest and growing anything. So, yeah, it seems to be like a combination. Um, it's they're very windy and steep slopes. So that's the first problem mm -hmm. is that um, it's the runoff is too constant. So the soil can't build up. Um, and the only thing that would hold soil on any kind of slope would be trees. So if you cut down the trees on islands like this, it's a huge problem. They would have needed mm -hmm. to manage their tree cutting very carefully. And it doesn't sound like they did. There's a lot they of, actually the deforestation is a big part of this, Tim, because it's symbolically parallel to the destruction of the weirwood net. And so it makes for a good real world thing that ties into the bigger themes thing. So yeah, th there's a lot of evidence that the tree cutting is, is a, was a big mistake that the ironborn made. Um, Yes, no, some of them are forested, somewhat. Uh, but again, more they used to be more so, and now there's only you know some trees. And that's why they have to go raiding and stuff uh, for to get trees. Literally, they have to go steal tree, they have to go steal lumber. Because <clears throat> driftwood, driftwood is a renewable resource, but not really for building ships. You can make campfires and things out of driftwood, but that's not something you're going to make ships from. Um, and by the way, I found out, Tim, uh, Arctic hunter-gatherers, their main source of wood was, in fact, driftwood. And that uh, driftwood from the Russian, uh, northern Russia and Siberia gets caught in the ice and then rotates over to northern Canada. And so the Inuits and the pre-Inuit Arctic hunter-gatherers basically had a steady supply of lumber that they could use for fire and small crafting and things. Uh, it all came from mm -hmm. Siberian driftwood. So driftwood is a real important part of island culture. And actually, I want to mention this. Everybody talks about the Ironborn as Vikings. And a lot of people have done a good job of saying, well, not exactly. You know, they're not as cultured as historical Norsemen in a lot of ways. I really think the Ironborn are largely also based on Arctic hunter-gatherers. Um, seals, whaling, uh, the oil lamps... The seal skin stuff, um, the uh, uh, is so much of it is is from hunter gatherers. The driftwood culture, they're just they're nastier and meaner because that's the pirate part. But there's a lot drawn from uh, Arctic hunter gatherer culture. So I think that's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, that that's why the Iron Islands don't they don't like it doesn't completely rule out volcanism is what I'm saying. Uh, because, like, mm. Iceland doesn't have very much uh, far farmable soil simply because it's so friggin' cold um, and so windswept. Uh, but it's definitely not Hawaii <laughs> or, like, <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. So I, I definitely tend to think that they are... If there is a volcano, it's a very ancient volcano that hasn't erupted in a long friggin' time. Yeah. <clears throat> But I think what we, can say for, what we can say for sure is that the Iron Islands were already in a bad situation and they made it worse by cutting down all of the trees. Many ancient forests of Europe were cut down to build the colonial navies of England, Spain, etc. Was the Great Empire of the Dawn harvesting weirwood and building ships near the Iron Islands? So, Jimmy, that's a really great question. Where was the Great King's weirwood arc built? Um, if it was... It's the thing about it is that it seems like a long range vessel because it's so big. It's not a long ship, it's huge. So the the first thing you think is that George is trying to tell us the Grey King is an ancient mariner who sailed here from far away on this huge boat that's clearly meant for sailing across the open seas. But then you're like, well, did he make a weirwood boat in the Great Empire of the Dawn? That would mean there are weirwoods in the Great Empire of the Dawn, which is interesting, but not implied, really. And we think it's kind of the reason they came to Westeros was for weirwood and green seer stuff. Now, we do have the shade trees in Essos. That implies that easily we could have weirwoods in Essos. It's nothing saying we couldn't. We have Children of the Forest and Giants and other things over in Essos, too. So 
I mean, I think it's very possible that the Great Empire of the Dawn had weirwoods and the weirwood arc was made there and sailed here. But maybe not. Maybe they came to the Iron Islands and there they made the weirwood arc and sailed it back to Ashai and back. Or maybe the weirwood arc is like a sacred thing used for magic and it's not even a friggin' boat. I don't know. Like, we don't know where the weirwoods came from to make that arc. It could have been Westeros or it could have been the, the, you know, the lands across the Sunset Sea. We, I don't know how we'll ever know unless I find some <laughs> symbolic clue that's telling me. Um, but the main thing is that the Great Empire of the Dawn did come to the Iron Islands. And the main reason that the Great Empire of the Dawn came to Westeros seems to be to obtain magic of the Weirwoods. So that very well could be a part of the story, right? Grey King comes to the Iron Islands. He brings culture, teaches the Ironborn, and he sits on the Weirwood throne. So it's almost like he came here to sit on the throne. It's also implied he made the throne, right? Because like... He slays Naga and then makes a throne out of her bones. So even if there's a couple different things mixed up there, he's still like, he's making the throne. He's making the long haul, right? Yeah. Maybe there used to be weirwoods. Yeah, um, so regrettable muffins say like, maybe there used to be weirwoods in Essos and the Great Empire destroyed them all, went to Far Station, went to Westeros to get more. And I brought up, like, that is a thing in the Far East. Um, huge, oh, maybe they got corrupted of... like the shade trees over there. Maybe. But one of the things that is happening in the Far East is there's huge levels of desertification because uh, I, brought, I brought this up before. You have the you have the forests of E.T., which are like rainforests. Then you have the green area uh, in Mossavi, which is the grim gray forest but in between both in between these areas it's just huge huge deserts like uh the patrimony of harkoom has fallen it's now reduced to three great city three cities that sit in the great sand sea and the great sand sea is is expanding because of widespread desertification uh all the lakes are drying up so yeah like th this is a thing and it could have been something that might have been happening in the great during the final years of the great empire of the dawn is if you're cutting down your forest and you have widespread desertification because for as much of an anti-war story that a song of ice and fire is there is a lot a lot of commentary on climate change here uh there constantly seems to be all of these uh ecological catastrophes whether it be deforestation de yep i would just say it's the broader I think what George is really talking about is just man's uh, relationship with nature, which is an older yeah. topic than just climate change. Because every civilization has had to deal with managing their re resources. Famously, the Maya mm -hmm. may have deforested themselves out of existence in part, although it's maybe exaggerated, but it was a big part of it. So, yeah, I think it's because if you think about the whole cycle, the season stuff and, you know, Azor High invading the wood, that's. The theme of that is man living at odds with nature instead of at harmony with nature. Like that's mm -hmm. what, that's where he got that idea of this wizard, this hubristic magician who wants all the power. He invades the nature magic and corrupts it for his own use. Like that's a story about hubris of man trying to dominate nature instead of live in harmony with it. So yeah, the climate change layers are just sort of like, follow from that i feel like because he has said that like it's not a direct metaphor for climate change and i think that's why he says that because he's mm. really talking about an even broader topic and that's too confining um but yes essentially yes yeah <clears throat> yep got a sorry he's a hippie man george is a deadhead so like <laughs> what do you expect this is hippie shit that's why I always defend it against like ac accusations of nihilism and things like that. Be like, no, no, life is dark, but there's hope. Okay, so where were we? Oh, I, I meant to show this picture earlier. This is uh, Grey King on the left. Uh, on the left, the artwork is Eve Ventru, and on the right is Michael Comark. That's the King of Winter statue. And I just put them back to back so you can see like pretty similar idea, right? Grey King turns gray. After a thousand years, the color of stone, and then you got these kings of winter on the stone kings, you know, just, yeah, pretty good. They even have the same beard. And if you think about it, get ready, Tim. 
You're not ready for this. Iron Man is Tony Stark. So the Starks are Iron Men. So <laughs> Iron Born and the Starks, obviously common origin. They're the Grey Kings, you know, the Stone Kings of Winter. Oh, um, I'm a big Bleach fan, and in there, uh, they have a group called the Espada, and the, the number one is named Coyote Stark, and his power is summoning a wolf pack that he makes out of his own spirit. That's so there's the Stark Wolf thing, Stark Iron thing is like all over the place. Iron Man. There should have been. How is there not an Aussie Stark? <laughs> oh, there's an Osric Stark. Osric. <laughs> there's the. Why didn't he put something about killing a member of House Went? Or when Ozzy ate the head of the bat. Come on, George. <laughs> <laughs> That's dope. See, I told you we'd find some new stuff today. Okay. <laughs> All right. So there you go. Um, and, and just to reiterate, you can see the point of the sigils is that the sigil is a concept. So how stone tree, that sigil is a commentary on the symbol of a stone tree, which touches everything from the Grey Kings, you know, petrifying to the Weirwood Thrones of Bran, to Winterfell being like a stone tree, to the sun, the Greyjoy that had grayscale and sat whispering in the dark like a green seer, okay? Whispering in the dark. <laughs> a windowless chamber, you mean like a cavern? Yeah. <clears throat> so... <laughs> All right, House Greyjoy. Now, oh, I've got one more stone tree. Here's Blood Raven. So I just wanted to, you know, there's your there's your stone kings, your gray kings, and there's Blood Raven, a gray corpse is described as being like a statue. So, and by the way, the Weirwood Throne is not all living Weirwood. It's dead branches woven into the living roots. So some of that will definitely petrify, like just facts, you know. I think the, mm -hmm. the Green Seer's body will petrify too, I bet. That's what I'm guessing. So, uh, House Greyjoy, we're moving. We're going over to Pike now. We're going to do Pike and oh. Salt Cliff at the same time. So on Pike, you have House Greyjoy, House Winch, House Botley. By the way, Lordsport, the biggest town... In the Iron Islands, they don't have a city. They have castles. Lordsport is kind of like Lannisport is bigger than Casterly Rock. Um, Lordsport is the biggest town, quote unquote, in the Iron Islands. That is how you get to Pike. Pike has no safe anchorage. So to get to Pike, you have to sail to Lordsport and then ride across the island. And that's what Theon did. Um, you know, he, he landed at Lordsport and then Asha found him and, you know, trolled him all the way across the island. <laughs> that's that's some shit all right so go ahead and give us uh give, give us what you got on on the island and house pike tim okay so uh just going back up pike, okay so pike name of island and castle also the surname of noble ironborn bastards um yeah so wex pike um he is a bastard of house botley um yeah, House Bali said Port Town, Lord's Port's one of the few safe anchor points in the Iron Islands, which is a, another one of these clues that the Iron Islands weren't event meant to be islands. Because for, for a seafaring nation, if you were always islands, you think they would have some harbors. But even though Pike, even though the Greyjoys are are the lords of the are the like the, the lords paramount essentially of the Iron Islands as the Lord Reaper, they don't have a safe harbor at Pike. But they do have a curtain wall at Pike facing the sea, which makes no sense unless there was supposed to be land originally on in, in that path. So you agree with my arguments then that that, that was a yeah. sound train of thought that like you wouldn't build your first and biggest castle where there's no harbor if you were a seagoing people. Like you need to be able to exactly. flee from your castle right to your ships, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have, but how are you going to do that? Yeah, how do you do that without a harbor? 
but there so there we have Lordsport. Lordsport's one of the actual harbors that's been built, but again, like there there should be more of these around the Iron Islands and there just aren't. There's so few. I really enjoyed Sorry, sorry to jump in, Tim. I just I really enjoyed that train of thought. Just fig- like, wait a minute, there's no harbors, and the name is Pike. It might be named, you know, the island might be named after the castle, and the curtain wall faces this way. It really felt like George was putting together a story for us to uh, mm-hmm. to piece together. So I'm glad you liked that. I was that was a lot of fun. Uh, but carry on. Yeah. So I was saying, like, that's what makes Lordsport so important. But then again, Lordsport is also feeling the wrath of Euron currently um, because uh, because Christopher, because uh, Sawain Botley uh, stands up to him. He tells him that he says that Euron doesn't have the right to claim the Iron Throne, that that should actually be going to Theon since Theon is the last living son of Bale and Greyjoy, that Theon should be getting it. Um, and then, of course, Christopher, his his support is, is behind Asha. Well, Euron, uh, he kills... Lord Sawain Botley, he drowns him, and um, then he splits the Botley lands in half, and he awards half of it to House Wench, because House Wench, the other Pike House, um, they are some of the earliest supporters of Euron, and then what Botley, House Botley is left is they're left with a uh, Garman Botley, he swears fealty to Euron, but that's because he's just trying to save face, and and just keep whatever little holdings they have left in their name. And he's trying to become a lord of it. But he's usurping Tristopher, his nephew Tristopher, by doing that. You're muted again. Thank you. That's Tristopher right there by Tiziano Baraki. Uh, keep going. I just put that up for you. Yeah, so, um, and then their their sigil, Silverfish on a Green Sea. So that's yeah, our, our obvious green sea metaphor, and then silverfish, fish people. So this is like some definite deep one talk, some squisher talk. Okay, well, so let's let's go ahead and dive into House Botley and circle back to the Greyjoys. There's a couple Greyjoy things to say. Obviously, like the whole thing is obviously. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, let's let's that'll work. So you yeah. mentioned the silverfish on green. Okay, so yes, it makes you think of the green sea, and but what are the silverfish? Well, the silver fish seem to be people. Um, the fish people tend to be silver, uh, I guess you could say. So House Tully, a silver trout on a field of red and blue, and then they dress up in silver fish armor or have a silver fish embroidered on their, you know, their coats and things. Then you have the Roinar uh, with their silver armor, and there's Nymeria. By the way, the Nymeria is... The artwork is by... J.K. Drummond, and uh, that's, um, is that, I guess that's Blackfish. Yeah, he's like got the partially red hair. Yeah, it's Blackfish Tully, and that's by Miguel. I'm so sorry, guys. Ah, oh, what are you doing to me, Photoshop? I'm sorry, I'm having screen issues here photoshop oh, this is cruel and unusual uh mm-hmm. miguel regadon harkness is the is the blackfish artist thank you just got to give the artist credit <laughs> apologize and then jk drummond on the right so yeah the roinar are obviously fish people of the river and so are uh the blackfish so are the tullies now the river is the river of time, and the weirwoods are the weir that sits across the river of time. So what happens uh, with the blackfish? Not only does he swim under the gate to escape River Run, which the gate is a weirwood symbol, okay? Because a weir is a gate, um, and through these gates, you and I may look to the past. Blood Raven says, talking about the river of time. Um, but then the Lannisters set up an actual weir, meaning like a wooden blockade over the river and blackfish swam under it so like what are the silver fish they're the green seers apparently they're they're the fish that can swim the river of time navigate the weir go in and out you know Mm -hmm. um that seems to be the symbolism that i could come up with and uh 
Here's and a couple. Someone's pretty... Go ahead. That silverfish are a type of bug too, because it's a dual meaning. And the silverfish on House Botley's, uh, considering how many are, they seem really small. So I think the idea is like if we're thinking of weirs as a trap for fish, these are the silverfish. They're the one. They're the fish that would be small enough to wriggle through the net, the way the blackfish is able to swim under uh, oh. his trap and escape. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, and then so also. Uh, so silverfish, Tim, they live where it's damp. They like rotting wood. That's yeah. where silverfish live. I looked this up. <laughs> um, so that kind of makes sense, too. It's like, oh, the mm. silverfish. Well, they're the, they live inside of rotting wood and wet wood. <laughs> wood water. Uh -huh. Okay, so check this out. George uses the silverfish to make a funny quote. It's a Tyrian quote. He went back to work after she left, trying to track some golden dragons through the labyrinth of Littlefinger's ledgers. Okay, so dragons are in a labyrinth. Remember, Stone Tree, Winterfell, Weirwood Net, labyrinth. What's inside the labyrinth? The Minotaur, a monster. That's Azor High, right? So the dragons here are in the labyrinth, tracking the dragons. So Tyrion is uh, Perseus. Is it Theseus or Perseus that goes in the labyrinth theseus yes okay um so we're trying we're tracking dragons through the labyrinth peter Baelish had not believed in letting gold sit about and grow dusty that was for certain but the more Tyrion tried to make sense of his accounts the more his head hurt it was all very well to talk of breeding dragons instead of locking them up in the treasury this i told you there's dragons locked up in the in the, in the labyrinth uh, but some of those ventures smelled worse than weak old fish <clears throat> I wouldn't have been so quick to let Joffrey fling the antler men over the walls if I'd known how many of the bloody bastards had taken loans from the crown. He would have to send Braun to find their heirs, but he feared that that would prove as fruitful as trying to squeeze silver from a silverfish. Because silverfish don't actually have silver. So it's a, it's a fun... Oh, it, it... Yeah, Theseus. Perseus kills the Medusa. Right, okay. So, yeah, um, silverfish, by the way, not harmful. They eat other bugs. You don't have to kill them unless there's like an infestation, in which case then you have rotting wood to look for. That's the real problem. Um, but, yeah, so that was cool. The whole bit about the, the dragon in the, in the labyrinth there and then flinging the antler men. That's, so that's, again, we kill green men when we go into the, into the weirwood net. So Joffrey, a corrupt solar king, killing antler men. Um, flinging them out like meteors. And then, so the meaning of the silverfish, I think we've gotten pretty close to it, but there is a couple of other things. So check this out. This is from A Dance with Dragons, Daenerys, Tim. A pike of unprecedented size, a pike, had been caught in the Skahazadan, and the fishermen wished to give it to the queen. She admired the fish extravagantly, rewarded the fishermen with a purse of silver, and sent the pike to her kitchens. So we've got a silverfish here and a pike. I'm not sure what's happening, but it seems related. What do you got? What do you got for me on that one? I don't I actually don't really have anything. I'm not sure what the deeper meaning of that one is. <clears throat> We're giving pike to the dragon. Hmm. And the dragon is giving us silverfish in return. Because it's silver for a fish. So it's fish silver. Also, there was the reference of smelling worse than weak old fish in the previous story. And then there's... Um, See, by and large, a peaceful people, the Roinar could be formidable when roused to wrath, as many would-be Andal Conqueror learn to his sorrow. The Roinish warrior, with his silver-scaled armor, fish-head helm, tall spear, and turtle-shell shield, which, again, you can see in the artwork, was esteemed and feared by all those who faced him in battle. It is said that the mother Roin herself whispered to her children of every threat. So, again, the Green Sea whispering to the silver fish people. So that's clearly, they're, again, they're green seers. They're hearing weirwood whisperings. 
that the Roynar Royna, princes wielded strange, uncanny powers, that Roynish women fought as fiercely as Roynish men, and that their cities were protected by watery walls that would rise to drown any foe. So, yes, stags are silver. That is the other thing that, thank you, that I wanted to link this to, is the silver stag is a constant symbol. So maybe that's part of the same thing. Like these silver fish that are green seers, maybe the silver stags is just another version. You know, the silver, but showing its, its stag-like aspect. It's just another way of calling them green seers. So like if a fish person is a green seer because it's a person that swims in the green sea, a stag person is a green seer because putting antlers on your head is like having branches on your head. And the, the green men were green seers, so... That's what I got for you on that. <laughs> Although we, the watery walls and the water magic, I wonder if that's part of House Merlin with its twinning water spouts. Oh, that's what that's got to be about. I was stumped on House Merlin. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Put a pin in that. They're in Great Wick. So we'll yeah, get, exactly. We'll get to Great Wick. And um, we are still on. Oh my God! What is this freaking? We've only done Harla. We've only done Harla and one and one house on Pike. <laughs> it's, I knew it was going to be a long one too. We're now going back <laughs> to the Greyjoys. So first of all, check out this incredible artwork by Lincoln Renal. Look at the masthead. Look at how Cthulhu-like is that masthead? That's sick. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> just sick. I also love the squid on the sail. So this is like my favorite Greyjoy ship artwork, I think. You could capture the terror too. The guy with the fire arrow, the burning sail, the, the few little fishermen in their boat. Like, yeah, you're fucked. <laughs> um, okay, so the Greyjoys. What did I want to say about the Greyjoys? Okay, so the actual place in the book where the phrase gray joy is used in a symbolic way is in Danny's vision in the house of the undying. There's one line that says a corpse stood at the prow of a ship, eyes bright in his dead face, gray lips smiling sadly. This is Victorian because Danny is in her vision. She's seeing all the people that are coming to her. One of whom is Victorian on a ship. Now he's a corpse because he's, Probably has to do with that hand. You know, he had mm -hmm. a rotting hand and then he got the fire magic. Like he's been, I don't know if he's whited, but he's definitely doing some transformation stuff. And it could be that he's still doomed to die because of that corruption, despite whatever's happened to his hand. I don't know. But gray lips smiling sadly. That's gray joy, obviously. The smile is literally gray and a sad smile is a gray joy figuratively. So... That's where it's used. It doesn't tell us anything about the Greyjoys. It's more like George using that language. It's part of the thing where how people appear in dreams, right? Like Blood mm -hmm. Raven appears as a three-eyed crow. Bran appears as a weirwood tree with a face. So these Greyjoys look like they're smiling sadly with gray smiles, I guess, right? It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Nothing really to take away from that, but it's just cool. Now, here's the mind-blowing quote, Tim. I'm going to read this, and then you can take it. I've got thoughts. I'll let you take it right after the quote, though. Okay, so this is Arya in A Storm of Swords. <clears throat> but a sudden shout snapped her head about before she, she could leap. She was thinking about jumping off the boat as her and Sander are crossing the river. That's what's happening. The ferrymen were rushing forward, poles in hand. For a moment, she didn't understand what was happening. Then she saw it. An uprooted tree huge and dark, coming straight at them. A tangle of roots and limbs poked up out of the water as it came, like the reaching arms of a great kraken. The oarsmen were backing water frantically, trying to avoid a collision that could capsize them or stove their hull in. The old man had wrenched the rudder about, and the horse at the prow was swinging downstream, and that's the masthead, the horse, but too slowly, glistening brown and black. Glistening black, Tim, like an oily stone, <laughs> the tree rushed toward them like a battering ram. It could not have been more than 10 feet from the prow when the two of the boatmen somehow caught it with their long poles. So we're catching a kraken. One snapped, and the long sp splintering crack 
made it sound as if the fairy were breaking up beneath them. Maybe that's a one moon, two moons thing. But the second man managed to give the trunk a hard shove, just enough to deflect it away from them. The tree swept past the fairy with inches to spare, its branches scrabbling like claws against the horse head. Only just when it seemed as if they were clear, one of the monster's upper limbs dealt them a glancing thump. The fairy seemed to shudder, and Arya slipped, landing painfully on one knee. The man with the broken pole was not so lucky. She heard him shout as he stumbled over the side. Then the raging brown water closed over him, and he was gone in the time it took Arya to climb back to her feet. One of the other boatmen snatched up a coil of rope, but there was no one to throw it to. You want me to comment on, like, the black stone or, or just anything? Take. I mean, that's the obvious angle, but if you got something else... Oh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot I could say about House Greyjoy that I'm not even sure where to start. Um, like, I guess one I want with, with House Greyjoy. Oh, no, Greyjoy. I'm sorry. I did want you to react to this quote specifically. I thought you meant like, yeah, no, anything in this quote. No, the, obviously it's the, it's the tree squid, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I think this is like, it's, it's foreshadowing more for Euron and what he's going to do because uh, Euron's been um, trying to cause like this magic maelstrom and it seems like Weirwood would it be would be definitely something that's going to and him drinking Shade of the Evening which comes from a Weirwood-esque tree like seems like he's going to be trying to invoke some kind of northern magic and then that's where the old gods come in because the old gods become a, another name meeting for these Cthulhu gods that the iron that the Ironborn worship. So it's like a weave. What we're seeing here, like with Ari, and this being an Arya POV chapter, is that weaving of Northern and Ironborn that we're constantly, constantly seeing. And it never, like, but we're trying to figure out, like, well, where does this make sense? Like, are these separate? Are they the same? Or has it just been that they've had so much cultural exchange that that this just that this these things just mesh together but again that comes back to the idea of the iron islands once being a part of the mainland then they would have had connections to all these places all the places that are now constantly seeing them as problems like the riverlands like the arbor like the westerlands and especially like the north yeah i, I really thought about um when uh I was reading about Denmark and how the marshes and forests sort of separated them from mainland Europe and allowed Viking culture to incubate uh, uninfluenced by stuff that was going on south of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it did remind me of the north and the, the neck and how the northern cultures isolated and developed differently. Um, yeah, I, I am going to get, Tim, in the Disaster Hunters series, I'm going to make a video about a northern passage. I've had some recent thoughts about it, and I think I have enough to talk about now. Um, and I will consult you. We'll talk about the gray waste and all that shit. Like, it, that's a, that's a yeah. part of this. Um, and part of that is the idea that the Starks may have come to Westeros a different way. Mm -hmm. And that they are different people. Um, there's a very old theory called the Starks are not first men from, like, 2014 on Westeros.org uh, that, oh. that I'm going to go back and reread. And uh, yeah. see if there's anything in there that I missed. But th this is a theory that that has some substance to it. So uh, this is a, this is one of those rare moments where I get to tell you to go watch one of my videos, which is go <laughs> check out the Mo go check out the Mossavy stream because I talk about the Starks and the Iron Board and come and this that oh. whole First Men of the East theory. <laughs> I see. Well, I'll be sure to watch your video about the thing that I'm thinking about making a video about before I make a video about it. <laughs> That does seem reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was gonna, obviously going to talk to you about. You guys should know I have Tim's text uh, phone number. Like we text direct. We don't. We don't even fuck around with social media. Like I will text him directly. Be like, Tim, tell me this about the deep ones. 
<laughs> so yeah because yeah. yeah, our friendship started with me messaging you and your answer would be like oh yeah here's this and then you refer me back to like a podcast or something i'd be like oh okay cool but like that's, like <laughs> that's why it's so funny that now i get to say to you like oh well you should check out the thing that i did. the student has become the master <laughs> <laughs> that's cool man it's cool well, I definitely will. And uh, yeah, this, the Disaster Hunter series has a lot of legs. It's going to go a lot of places. But let's keep this thing moving. So mm -hmm. real quick, guys, the, there's a couple of things that I took. It's interesting. You looked at the Kraken tree and were thinking about Euron. Hmm. Um, I, my mind always goes back to the Dawn Age and the archetypal things, right? So yeah. this is we just saw earlier the tree scratching at the sky. The Night Fort Weirwood wants to pull the moon down into the well. And there's other quotes along those lines as well. In the wolf's wood, the trees are uh, scratching at the moon. It's a combination of the other two quotes. The, the claw fingers of the trees are scratching the moon. So hmm. this is kind of partly what this Kraken symbol is about. It refers to the deep ones, yes. But the arms of the Kraken, what does the Kraken do? It pulls things down. We're going to get to House Winch in a second. We've got a moon sigil and the name Winch. It's like, what are we doing? Pulling the moon down? Maybe. <laughs> um, so the weirwood arms, the weirwood magic, really, that reaches up into the astral realm, calls a comet or whatever, whatever, that, whatever the hell is causing the disaster, weirwood magic seems to be a part of it. And this is how George is telling us. He's showing us the weirwood tree, when uprooted, like it's like a a monster in the sea that pulls things down into it. So when the weirwoods are corrupted and misused by Azor High, he pulls down the moon, causes the darkness. And what do these moon meteors look like? They look like the oily black kraken stones. And so this tree is glistening black and brown like a kraken stone. And what is it doing? It's, it's destroying things in the sea. It's um, uh, the boat shuddered and Arya fell. I think that's Nissa Nissa. Agony and ecstasy shuddering there. Um, and remember, we had the two Pullman, like the two moons. One cracks and one falls into the water, and the other one doesn't. So, yeah. I think that's yeah. pretty much what's going on there. I just remember when we first made the connection between the kraken and the tree, it was just so obvious. It was like, of course, the tree roots look like kraken tentacles, and they're described as tentacles. It was just like, duh, this is the perfect evil weirwood symbol, the kraken. And even the golden kraken on black, you could think of the moon exploding with these arms of fire, like the shootings, you know, pieces of flaming rock going out in every direction like these arms. And eventually you would turn into a black squid because you'd have the black mm -hmm. smoky tentacles emanating from everywhere, emanating from up off the ground in all the, you know, when the meteor hits, so you have the mushroom clouds. So that's like a black tentacle reaching up to the sky just like the, again, the black trees that are scratching at the sky. So you can see how the symbolism works uh, with the Kraken tree. It's all about the corrupting of the weirwoods and the pulling down of things from the sky, these black smoky tentacles. It's great stuff, man. Great symbolism. I love it. So that's your Greyjoy symbolism. Um, as far as the logistics of House Greyjoy, that's kind of what my entire friggin ironborn series i mean it's really the history of the ironborn so it's like the Greyjoys rule on castle pike well castle pike is so old no one knows who built it so it probably wasn't the Greyjoys. and the sea stone chair was found on old wick and brought to pike so it tells you at some point when the ironborn set up this you know when the Greyjoys set themselves up as kings they claimed that chair and brought it over there and used it as a throne. Not the brightest idea, in my opinion, but that's apparently what they did. So the Greyjoys' history must be very old. Like, the history of the Greyjoys, these are basically the first people on the Iron <laughs> Islands that moved the Kraken throne over to Pike. So when they say, oh, the first people found it, like, the Greyjoys were amongst those people because they claimed it. And they took mm -hmm. it to the old castle that no one knew, and they claimed that too. So they claimed the two most mysterious things on the islands and said, we are lords of this. We possess this now. But they claimed those things. They did not make them, and they don't know where they came from. So the Greyjoys are some sort of inheritors 
of these things. Yeah. Yeah, and this comes to the the biggest standout to me for the Greyjoy and their sim and their sigil, which is the fact that it's a yellow kraken. Because your name is Greyjoy. You're trying to trace ancestry to the Grey King. Yeah, why isn't your, it a Grey Kraken? Good point. Yeah, why isn't it a Grey Kraken? Um, gray and green would gray or green for green sea symbolism and all the Cthulhu connections, because you literally one of your one of the sons of House Greyjoy, Aaron Dampair, is a priest of the Drowned God. Gray or green would be the most obvious choices because those are the colors most connected with Cthulhu. Same thing with his sons, uh, the idol of Zothamog and the Zothic legend cycle I talk about. It's made out of great greasy gray stone with mottled specks of green. So these seem like the two most obvious colors, right? But the the kraken is yellow. And then that's when I started, I was like, well, why is that? And that's when I started going into, you know where I'm going with this. It's the king in yellow stuff. And because George does do that. And then we connect this to the idea of the Ironborn coming from the Far East. Well, out in the Far East, the furthest, most Eastern point on the map is Carcosa, which is in the Shadowlands, like a shy. Like if we look at a shy, a shy is at the very Southern end. Stagai is in the middle. And then Carcosa is the north. These are you got your 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 top, middle, bottom of the Shadowlands, three legendary cities. Mm -hmm. And Carcosa has the yellow sorcerer lord who is a king in yellow figure. Okay, I like so this. This is becoming yeah. my head cannon quickly. The Ironborn are from Carcosa. I dig it. Keep going. Um, can yeah, I so that, can I actually go get Cleo and give? Mm -hmm. Can you take over for like about two minutes or so? I'll turn it up so I can still hear you. But I got to get Cleo and use the restroom, and I'll be right back. Yeah. Thank oh, of you. course. Yeah. So this, <laughs> this I, I'm, I, I get super excited when we talk about this, because this is the thing that like I've been laying down time and time again, but I always love coming back to it is George's use of Carcosa and how I feel his placement of it on the map is very deliberate because it literally sits at the end of the earth. It is where the map ends, where the light ends and the shadows begin because it's situated at the top of the Mountains of the Morn on the Hidden Sea. Uh, so when we connect that to the Carcosa mythos, to Ambrose and Chambers and all that, their Carcosa sits on the Lake of Holly, which is a cloud lake. Well, the, hid the Hidden Sea, um, sitting in the Mountains of the Morn, it would be a very misty sea. So I've always been of the impression that the Ironborn probably originally come from Carcosa, um, we don't know exactly how far away Carcosa is from the shore because the map cuts off. So there could be miles and miles of land, or it could be that Mossavi and Carcosa are right next to the sea the way Ashai was. And that is why whenever we talk about people coming from Ashai, what needs to be said is that doesn't mean they're all from Ashai, just that they all gathered in Ashai. Because when you're thinking of the collapse of an empire and people trying to escape, they're gonna be running in all different directions. It doesn't make any sense for people who are living in the Eastern part of the empire to try and make it across the entire way West while, whoops, something fell. Um, for them to try and scatter all the way West across a land that's in chaos, only to then get met with the obstacle of the bones that is so much no if you're on the eastern side chances are you're going to firmly further east and take your chances out that way that's why a shy seems like such a good gathering point as a port city at the southern tip of the shadowlands being a large city as a good gathering point for all of these ships to leave so i've always been of the opinion that the ironborn are probably from that sort of regional area and Carcosa always made the most sense that they probably fled down. If they didn't leave from Carcosa itself, then they're probably fleeing down into the Shadowlands, getting to a shy, and then everyone's kind of coalescing in a shy and leaving from there, trying to get wherever they can to safety. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was trying to say in my video when I was saying the Great Empire of the Dawn lands around there. Not everyone from mm -hmm. the Great Empire of the Dawn is the same. Yeah, obviously there's a level of specificity at which we have to stop. And we don't know. George is just saying it was a big empire. All these lands were part of it. People came from there. 
etc. The Ironborn do seem different. They don't look Valyrian, right? So they're obviously mm. a tribe of people that's not, you know, they don't look Valyrian. There's Siegfried Silverhair. I mean, mm -hmm. it's probably just old, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, maybe just went silver a little early, but maybe not. Maybe maybe Siegfried Silverhair is, is a... There are a few Valerian Ironborn, and George has just never told us. But I love this Carcosa idea. This also makes sense to me because Euron is the direct parallel for the king in yellow. That, that's very yeah. obvious. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of, by making the Greyjoy crack in yellow, George is kind of saying Euron is actually the archetypical Greyjoy, not the other yeah. ones. Like, he's the one that embodies the sigil, which is king mm -hmm. in yellow. And then George has given us the king in yellow in Carcosa in the current story. So that, to me, yeah. is a point in favor of your, of your story. I like that. I like this. Yeah. You guys, and Gray Tim was just spitting fire. If you're not subscribed to Gray Waste Tim's YouTube channel, go subscribe right now just for that last five minutes. That was outstanding. Yeah. And because the two biggest aspects of the King in Yellow, when it goes from uh, Chambers to being incorporated into Lovecraft, is he is both a stag man, but also a squid person. And when we so here we and and George does that with the inversion of color of color sigils because we have our yellow kraken on a black field for our squid people, which are the Greyjoys. But then you invert that, uh, and we have a black stag on a yellow field for the Baratheons, representing our stag men, which makes them the two king. They are both king and yellow figures representing different aspects of the King in Yellow, the Chambers version where he's a stag man, and then his incorporation into Lovecraft where he becomes more of a Cthulhu-esque figure where everything gets tentacles. So which one is the bastardized version, Tim? Because they're inverted. So one is the bastardized version of the other. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to go back, uh, the original Hastur, um, before Lovecraft turned him into, before Lovecraft turned him into a, a Cthulhu god, and before Chambers turned him into the King in Yellow, Hastur is from Ambrose Bierce, where he is a god of shepherds. What were the Valyrians before they became dragon riders? Cool. <laughs> So you can see, like, it's just layered upon layered upon layered. You have three different authors, three different aspects of this of this deity that is Hastor, and George is incorporating all three in different areas into his story. Every aspect of the King in Yellow, from Ambrose to Chambers to Lovecraft, is all right here, scattered about. And so, and yes, the the Karsnark is right. If tree. Uh, branches can be like tentacles then the stag antlers can also be like tentacles because the whole point of stag antlers on your head is to look like tree branches on your head look like a tree person mm -hmm. um, that's why the stag is the king of the wood that's part of the reason why it's it's a parallel there so yeah um, that's again gets back to the whole driftwood crown and naga's naga's teeth crown which is really a weird crown like these wooden crowns would also look like tentacle crowns, you know? Yeah. So it's all, yeah, this is, this and, is how George uses symbols to kind of link his parallelisms together, I guess is the baby. Yeah, because it's so amazing to me how comfortably a Song of Ice and Fire could fit into the Cthulhu mythos, but it's become a, but it's a thing all of its own. It's just like George just loves to, throw out his his, uh, his influences and wear them on his sleeve. And he's constantly giving these Easter eggs, these tip of the hats, these nods. It's, it's wonder. Like I said, I love it. I love, I love uh, chasing the stuff. The word is tapestry. You know, mm -hmm. the threads that he's weaving are all the ideas from everywhere in the, all of history mm -hmm. of man, history, literature, mythology, comics, weaving them all together. Ice and fire is the tapestry. That's what he's doing. So, Let's move over to House Winch because this ties very well into the Kraken symbolism that we were just discussing. Um, I've got some other Greyjoy art real quick. Um, this is on the left, Victorian by Connor Burke, and on the right, uh, the Red Kraken, Dalton Greyjoy by Being Axel. And this, both superb works of art. So I feel like we could just gaze on these for a second. Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken 
is a terrific Azor High symbol. Now, I will point out that there is an entire line of Azor High archetypes that are pirates. Euron, first of all. Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken. Um, <clears throat> then there is uh, Orain Waters, who looks like Rhaegar. Becomes Lord of the Waters. He looks like a dragon lord, but he's got green eyes. And he's Lord of the Waters. He becomes pirate. He turns pirate. Um, and he steals the queen's ships, which is like stealing Nyssa's tree. Same thing. Um, and then there's uh, Daemon Targaryen, who becomes the king of the Narrow Sea on Bloodstone Island. Okay, with his red dragon. It's like red kraken, red sword, lightbringer. Okay. Um, and is there one other pirate Azor Ahai? I feel like there's a fifth one. I guess Stannis, I mean, he smashed the Greyjoy fleet like he's a bit of a sea captain. Um, but... Did you mention Dagon Greyjoy, the last reaver? Who? Dagon Greyjoy, the last reaver. Oh, I was getting... So Dalton Greyjoy is the Red Kraken. Who's Dalton's Dagon Greyjoy? the Red Greyjoy? Kraken. Uh, Dagon Greyjoy is he's he's the one during Duncan Egg's time. The one he's the one that's uh that Blood Raven is constantly ignoring, and that's why people don't in the Westerlands in the North don't like him. Ah, yeah. Well, what else does he do though? So Dagon Greyjoy, we don't have much information on him. I think George is really keeping this under wraps for the next Duncan Egg story. Oh. I said I think the she. I, I'm pretty sure. I think the She Wolves of Winterfell is gonna is probably when we're gonna see him proper. But re what the information we get on Dagon Greyjoy is that he was the last great Reaver. He is the one really trying to bring back the old way up until ba up until uh, Balin Greyjoy is in charge, and he is reaving along the coast of the Westerlands in the north. But Blood Raven is more or less ignoring it like he knows it's a problem but he's so focused on the black fires out east that he's sort of leaving it to the north and the westerlands to take care of on their own but he's being much more of a problem than anyone anticipated and it really takes so and that is where we get um lord Beric stark who's one of the it's one of the statues that Theon mentions when he's down in the crypts with Barbary Dustin. He's the one that gathers the swords. He basically calls the banners in the north and leads them to fight Dagon Greyjoy. So that's why I said I think She Wolves of Winter is going to be called that because da Barrack Greyjoy is going to call the banners to fight Dagon. So all the men are going to leave and all that's going to be left in Winterfell okay. are the women. Okay. Stop. <laughs> I can't take any more. <laughs> so <laughs> you're telling me that Dagon Greyjoy, Dagon being a quintessential squisher name, right? Mm -hmm. He is in trying to invade the North. Who repels him? You'd say it was Beric? Yeah. Beric Stark? Like Beric, Beric Stark. the Azor High figure who sits in a weirwood throne in a cave? And you're telling me that <laughs> we've met the Beric Stark statue in the in the crypts? So mm -hmm. yeah, this is more this is more for my theory that Grey King is just showing us a Blood Raven process. Because Beric Stark is a weirwood king, but also a king of winter. And he's repelling the Krakens. Yeah, and it's the thing is Grey King is a weirwood dude. I think he's he's not um yeah, we'll get I I, I don't want to side branch, but yes. Um oh, Victarion is the other one because he's got the fiery red hand. So that's an Azor mm -hmm. High symbol. And he's obviously a pirate uh, going to uh, steal Daenerys, you know, the, the Nissa Nissa queen. So the whole point of Azor High being a pirate, there's two points. It's a beautiful thing. One, Great Empire of the Dawn sailed to Westeros and invaded it like pirates to steal stuff. So Azor High, Bloodstone Emperor, a literal pirate. Basically. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. sailed to Westeros. Also, they're stealing the magic of the Green Sea. So, of course, they're pirates. They're pirates of the Weirwood Net, the Weirwood Sea. So the Azor High Pirate Lord thing is very important. I've keyed in on that for a long time. And it's, that's why we've got all these uh, red krakens and red Victorian hands and things. And then, of course, fucking Euron posing as a dragon lord. <laughs> so there you go. There's your other Greyjoy art. Oh, I've also got this one. 
you guys have seen this in the video a thousand times, but obviously the sigil is based on the chair. So like they took their sigil from the chair. They changed the color, but I just do want to point out the very obvious thing. The Greyjoys, remember I just said the Greyjoys would have been the first people who claimed the chair, moved it to Pike, claimed the castle, and said, I'm the Lord Reaper, bitch. So they took mm. their for their sigil the chair. And that just confirms the origin of the house is in the chair. And finally, okay. the... Oh, go ahead, Tim. I just want because you said that whole thing about posing as a dragon lord. Uh, another king and yellow connection of the Yi-T emperors, the yellow emperor, uh, not the sorcerer lord currently out in Carcosa, but the one that we hear about in old history. Um, he marries a Valyrian noblewoman and keeps a dragon at his court which uh, is, is a King and Yellow story. It's the only story where the King and Yellow actually speaks. It's called In the Court of the Dragon. But the point is, is that it's not his dragon, right? It's his wife's dragon. So this Yellow Emperor is posing as a dragon lord. Right. Yes. Yeah. That makes sense. Someone asked me to turn it upside down so it looks more like a tree. <laughs> so there you go. Let's not make the squid, all the blood rush to the squid's head, though. So I'll turn it back. That's, that's torture. Okay, House Winch. Here we go. Ah, oh, yes. <clears throat> this art is from Digital Blasphemy, who makes some really cool stuff that I like to use. Some uh, churning of the universe, the moon explosion one. Um, so House Winch, as we've talked about, alludes to the idea of pulling down the moon, just as the idea of the Kraken tentacles being like the tree branches that reach for the moon. A winch that pulls things, it tows things, it tugs things. That's what it does. It reels things in. So this is like not even... This is one of the times when I'm like, George, Jesus Christ, dude, giving it away, right? Mm -hmm. It's like the bloody the moon sickle, house winch. Even the purple and white, like the Valerian colors and House Dane. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, ah, uh, where did the House Dane meteor come from? Was it a moon meteor? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but the, and that was, that's what makes it so important that they are the first Ironborn house to declare for Euron. They are his first. The, the house whose sigil is literally the wench pulling down the moon declares for Euron first. Oh, well, that's that's cool. <laughs> That's cool. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So let's see here. She wondered who was in command of her foes. This is Asha in Deepwood Mott, um, or in the Wolfswood. If it were me, I would take the Strand and put our longships to the torch before attacking Deepwood. The wolves would not find that easy, though, not without longships of their own. Asha never beached more than half her ships. The other half stood safely off to sea with orders to raise sail and make for Sea Dragon Point if the Northmen took the Strand. Hagen! Blow your horn and make the forest shake. Triss, don some mail. It's time for you to try out that sweet sword of yours. When she saw how pale he was, she pinched his cheek. Splash some blood upon the moon with me, and I promise you a kiss for every kill. So there's the bloody moon. And in this same chapter, like I said, the trees of the wolf's wood, which some of which are weirwoods, appear to be scratching at the face of the moon. It's like a paragraph before this. So first the trees are attacking the moon. Uh, by the way, Asha herself, a moon maiden, a wayward bride. Um, she, is, uh, she is the moon maiden. The, the, and the wolves that are hunting her are dressed up like trees. So the trees are trying to capture Asha the moon maiden, the tree wolves. The actual trees are scratching at the moon. And then Asha is like, yeah, let's splash some blood upon the moon. And then a kiss for every kill. That's Azor Ahai killing Nissa Nissa, whom he loved, agony and ecstasy. And then, of course, blowing your horn and making the forest shake. We're going to get to House Good Brother, but the horns are also heavily implied as being part of calling down the apocalypse. It's basically the two things that call down moons and moon meteors and comets and scratch at the sky and attack the sky. There's two things, horns and trees. So save the horn stuff for Good Brother. But for now, yeah, the horn is making the forest shake. So that sounds like a horn that causes an earthquake, like the horn of Joramin or something like that. Uh, 
It's a, it's a great little passage. But yeah, it reminded me of House Winch just because of the bloody moon and the trees attacking the moon there. And yeah, you can see that this tree here, if you just rotated it a little bit, it'd make an awesome antlers. You know, you just stick a head right under it. So, yeah, buddy. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Tim? No, nah, like, that's pretty much it. Because we don't get much more information aside from that, aside from just Walden Wench first to Claire and getting awarded half the Botley lands after Euron kills Lord... Uh, Trist Christopher's dad. So it's like now Pike is pretty much split between Wench and Greyjoy, them being like his biggest supporters. Oh, so split. it seems that like makes sense. Yeah, the moon gets split, the weirwood net split. So that kind of that kind of figures. Yeah, House Wench seems like one of those houses that's going to be more important. That's going to be more important later with the symbolism. Uh, probably a wench, uh, someone from House Wench on Euron's crew is probably going to do something that's going to seem like very moon grabby for Euron, who's essentially the guy trying to clutch the moon and bring it down and be this new Azor a high figure. Well, and that's a perfect way to illustrate, Tim, how George uses these sigils. He creates these little symbols, like they're like hieroglyphs, and then mm -hmm. he can use them to make sentences. So and he, he, if he needs to talk about stone tree and the moon and the scythe that cut it down, he can mention uh, mm -hmm. Harlaw, Winch, and stone tree. Yep. And then he's telling exactly. a story. It's hi, I thought of this the other day. They are like hieroglyphs. They're like picture grams with a whole complex set of ideas behind each one. And the, the sentences in the story can be read as chains of symbolic hieroglyphs. That's essentially how we're reading it when we're looking at these second uh, meanings. So it's pretty fun to think about it that way. And, yeah, because uh, and that's, that's what goes into being a gardener writer, is him throwing these seeds around. If he feels the need for it, it's like, well, uh, how can I make this it. work? Oh, that wench seed I threw? Well, it's time for that one to sprout. And you just give a guy a name. We already have one, Walden Wench. Well, it could be something like, well, Walden Wench's son is, is on Euron's crew. Does it, you know? Because not every not every member of his crew has has. Wait, what's name. his name? So the current lord of House Wench is Walden. W a l d o n. Uh. And yeah, he is the first to declare for Euron. That means wooded valley. That's cool. So yeah. And that just like House Winch got the mm -hmm. bloody moon. What's the other part of the picture? It's the trees that pull the moon down. So the name of the Lord of House Winch is Wooded Valley. So a Wooded Valley Winch pulls mm -hmm. down the moon. And when you think of a valley, that's darkness. So a tree that's in shade and darkness is the winch that pulls down the moon, which by the way, it looks like the dawn meteor. <laughs> like, and it's done with blood magic. You get a, a bloody sickle, you cut somebody's throat. That's part of it too. Like, that's sick. That's sick. So you got to use the, the translations of the names and then the sigils mm -hmm. work together to tell this story. Go ahead, Cleo. Come here. Come here, girl. That's a pretty fun <laughs> one. Hidden Valley Ranch. No, John Racine, you're just hungry. Now you're making us <laughs> hungry. <clears throat> so here's the Night Fork quote about the tree. I'll just read it for posterity. We should sleep, Jojen said solemnly, after they were full. The fire was burning low. He stirred it with a stick. Perhaps we'll have another green dream to show us the way. Hodor was already curled up and snoring lightly. From time to time, he thrashed beneath his cloak and whimpered something that might have been Hodor. Look, likely it was, since that's all he says, Bran. <laughs> Bran wriggled closer to the fire. The warmth felt good, and the soft crackling of the flames soothed him, but the sleep would not come. Outside, the wind was sending armies of dead leaves marching across the courtyards to scratch faintly at the doors and windows. The sounds made him think of old Nan's stories. He could almost hear the ghostly sentinels calling to each other atop the wall and winding their ghostly war horns. So the sentinels, those are tree people, and they're blowing horns. Remember, he just said, Hagen, blow, blow your horn and make the forest shake. What's Hagen mean? It's a skin changer name. In Youthful one enclosure okay anyway um 
Ghostly sentinels calling to each other, winding their ghostly war horns. Pale moonlight slanted down through the hole in the dome, think dome of the sky, painting the branches of the weirwood as they strained up toward the roof. Weirwood is um, Yggdrasil is painted and whitewashed by the Norns, by the way. So this that's what George is alluding to. The moonlight painting the weirwood pale. Silver, by the way. Um, it looked as if the trees were trying the tree was trying to catch the moon and drag it down into the well. Old gods, Bran prayed, if you hear me, don't send me a dream tonight. Or if you do, make it a good dream. The gods made no answer. So here at the Night Fort, which is all about Night's King and the others and all that shit, we have this weirwood trying to pull down the moon. And uh, yeah, it just, it goes along with the quote at Raven Tree Hall, where we have a dead weirwood that's been poisoned. And here, here it's a living weirwood, but it's the one at the knife fort. So very good parallels. Anything to add, Tim? Uh, no, I think we just, I uh, think we covered with Greyjoy, Botley, and, and Wench. That's all of the houses on Pike. I think we can move to the next island. You're saying that the people who are playing the Moon Meteor drinking game are good and drunk, is what you're saying. <laughs> so here is that Night Fort Weirwood, by the way. This artwork is by Iveson Wild. Again, the previous one, Digital Blasphemy. Check them out online. They have You can download all their artists like screensavers and stuff, too. So definitely check out Digital Blasphemy. And this is Iveson Wild. So yeah, this is that Night Fort Weirwood. It's actually not supposed to have a face, but we'll allow it. So... Okay. House Sunderly. House Sunderly. They Balin, are Euron, Victorian, Uragon, and Aaron. As you pointed out, Tim, the sons mm -hmm. of a Sunderly of Salt Cliff. So, Sunderly, this is, okay, this is interesting. Well, actually, why don't you go ahead and give me whatever you got on Sunderly, and I'll, I'll come in with, my shit's kind of weird on that, so go ahead. Okay. Obviously, the well, sigil looks like a dr the drowned god because Euron describes yeah. the drowned god, and he says, "Look at him, you know, a dead, a dead, feeble person being nibbled by fish." Do you pray to that? So that implies that this sigil is actually the drowned god in in some sense. Yeah. So yeah, like he's that their sigil, drowned man, pink and pale, floating upright in a blue green sea. Uh, so calling Greyjoy. Second wife is a woman of House Sunderly. That is the mother of Balon, Euron, Victarion, Aeron, and Ergon. So Aeron the damp hair, the drowned man. Well, his mother is essentially a drowned woman, based symbolically on this sigil of House Sunderly. And then there's the name Sunderly. And we've made the same connection when we were talking about the three sisters who are ruled by House Sunderland to sunder, to break apart. So Sunderlin is like breaking apart the land. And here, Sunderly, it's the same idea. So again, we're coming back to this idea of the Ironborns being broken pieces of, of a once bigger landmass. Sunderly is a name that invokes that. You're muted again. <laughs> And the fact that the sigil is a drowned man, it's like the drowned man is very emblematic of the Ironborn. That's either the drowned god or it represents all of the Ironborn who are drowned to the drowned god. So it's a very, mm -hmm. oh, it's, it represents the entire Ironborn. And so this house, Sunderly, it's kind of like saying, yeah, the entire Iron Islands were sundered. Um, and then you compare that to the three sisters also where House Sunderland there's heavy squisher sign there. So it just also encourages you to think about another place where they have, you know, the mark and the webbed hands and stuff. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, and this picture, by the way, is Donatoji and Cola. Um, I guess that's damp hair squatting down. It's labeled air on damp hair. So I guess that'd be the one about to perform the CPR. This is essentially the scene that we get in damp hair's first chapter. Um, so let's see, what did I have here? Oh, well, the, the three sisters was the other part you suggested when we talked about, um, the three sisters themselves, that maybe we're looking at three moon meteor impacts. And that's a theory I used to talk about more. Some people are more a fan of that than the others, like three heads of the dragon, 
three major impacts, a shy arm of Dorne, iron islands, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And so the three sisters that sundered the land are the three meteors. And they're also like the three daughters, which is another phrase for a different, uh, the three kingdoms, uh, Lys, Tyrosh, and Mir, three daughters of the moon that died, you know, are the moon meteors. Yeah. They're daughters of it. So it's children. And the three vassals, because even though it's the three sisters, there's technically four lords, because you have House Sunderland, who's in charge of all of them, but each island, each individual island has its own lord. We have Borel, so Bor, to Bor, is to like dig under. Uh, there's Longthorpe, so Long long Village, Long Hamlet. And then the last one is Torrin. Torrin should be like self-explanatory, crashing waves, and they're all vassals to Sunderland. So the squ- like it's like the uh, Lord Squisher sunders the land, and then here we have three lesser squishers underneath him, but they all represent the idea of bo- of waves crashing, boring under, and building a city. I think like it really sounds like building a city under the sea, which is exactly what deep ones do. Interesting. Very cool. And yes, just to reiterate that the deep ones do build watery halls and the, the, the ironborn belief in watery halls probably is like a garbled version of the actual watery halls mm-hmm. that are under the ocean. I will talk more about that in the ironborn series, but that is a fun idea. Yeah. And then to, same thing here. Um, Cause I had talked about how you're on, We've said, like, Euron is, like, the quintessential Ironborn. It's why he's able to win the King's Move, because he's the... uh, The Ironborn look to him as, like, this is what an Ironborn king should be. And yet, at the same time, he's, like, a rejection of all of it because he's a storm god, and the storm god is the enemy of the drowned god. So he's, like, a complete rejection of his whole family. Well, then when you throw the Sunderlies in there and them having the sigil of the drowned man... That really cements, like, no, he's a rejection of his entire family, father and mother, by rejecting the Drowned God. This, by the way, is by far the ugliest squisher I have found. Uh, This Mm -hmm. is by Dan Moore. This one speaks to me, man. This really, like... This thing wants to eat you or fuck you or both. Like, it's very clear. It's, it's going to be gross, and he's all about it, you know? I mean, it really captures the terror. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, and the reason why I've got this is because, like, this is what the Ironborn think the Drowned God is. But really, the gods under the sea mm, probably look more like that. <laughs> so that's the idea. It is kind of well, cute. You that, know what? You're right. It is kind of cute. I mean, I, that's not. Really, that's more like what the minions of the gods under the sea look like. Because the gods under the sea would look more like Cthulhu, and then we're going back to the Greyjoy sigil. That mm. crap. That and because Cthulhu is described as having aspects of kraken, man, and dragon, and that's why too. Like if even though Euron's never gonna get it, but if he were somehow somehow in some way to get with Danny and have a son upon her, that child would symbolic be symbolically be a Kraken dragon person. I like how the chat has completely overruled me. We've decided this thing is cute. <laughs> <laughs> I've been overruled. It is though. You're right. I can sort of, you can see it patting on its head and be like, okay, thank you. <sighs> I'm like maybe it's, yeah, I can see that. I wouldn't trust it though. Like, don't leave it alone with your kids. You come back and like the kid's gone, and it's just like, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's that kind of cute. All right, so moving right along, Salt Cliff. Oh my God, Tim. The Salt Cliff. headed black serpent. <laughs> there's not much to say about them, except for the sigil is a nine-headed sea serpent. So again, we're it's talking good. about the fact that the sea dragon. And the Leviathan yeah. stuff is an allusion to classic mythology. Uh, specifically, the Lernian Hydra is a seven-headed sea dragon in Greek myth. And then we've got, uh, this is Ninurta and the Asag dragon uh, from, I think it's Sumerian. But they all had a version of the multi-headed dragon. Like, literally, they all had a version of this myth. It's everywhere. It's in Proto-Indo-European, Proto-Indo, 
Proto-Indo-European myths and Middle Eastern myths. It, it traveled across all of them. And we're still trying to figure out where it comes from and how old this original Dragon Slayer myth is. Seems like at least 10,000 BC, by the way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, how Salt Cliff, for whatever reason, it's a nine-headed sea serpent. Usually it's seven heads in mythology. So by doing nine heads, Tim, the nine symbolism in the story, like there's Weirwood Grove of Nine, the Starks, nine iron spikes on the crown. Most people think of the Nazgul there, which is the famous nine in fantasy uh, from Lord of the Rings, the ring race. There's nine of them. So, yeah, yeah. The other than the fact that this is Hydra. loosely talking about Naga and Hydras and shit, what do, what do you have to say about Sawcliff? Well, so there's the Larnian, uh, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, yeah. L-E-R-N-A-E-A-N, Hydra, yeah, from Greek mythology, is described as having nine heads. Um, oh, it is? But again, like, it is described as it's nine-headed. Oh, well, joke's and on me, what's then. But what's important here, and this is why I made the point of like, and this is what makes this good, is because you're covering a lot yeah, of right the, there, it, right there. It has nine heads right on the damn screen. I could have just counted. <laughs> good job, Tim. Glad you're here, buddy. I but, uh, been... <sighs> Sorry, go ahead. I just my chat would have corrected you. Yeah, but um, they would. What I, was, what I was getting at is like, because how you're covering a lot of the uh, history of these families, but my notes have been on, well, what are they currently doing now? And that's why I made it a point of not only noting the sigils, but who they supported in the King's moot. The current Lord of Saltcliffe is Donner Saltcliffe, and he supports Euron. So when we think, like, again, sigils telling a story, the nine-headed Black Hydra is on Euron's side. So again, and like, so that tells you so much more, like, when we again like you that's why you really got to look at not of who are their supporters and then when you see well who are and then you see the sigils of who supported who it begins to like give you a greater picture of what's going on donner means thunder as mm -hmm. in beric dondary and the lightning lord donner and blitzen the reindeer um thunder and lightning donner is thunder dondar so yeah uh yeah the it's just like the nine-headed, the sea dragon and the lightning bolt of the storm god are the same thing, Tim. Mm -hmm. That's the message here. Um, <laughs> now, why are they named Salt Cliff is what I don't get. Is like, is the moon the salt cliff? Is the wall the salt cliff? It looks like a salt cliff. Are we talking about Lot here? Lot's wife? Like, I don't... I'm not sure why all this freaking hydra shit is associated with salt cliff i mean i i understand the idea that like well salt cliff is one of the uh wives of quell and Greyjoy or whatever but other than that i just i don't see the link i'm not sure what is that like white those white chalk mountains um the white chalk what do you mean what white chalk mountains uh there's i think they're like uh, I, should, I knew I should. In the real this world, up. or in Ice and Fire. In the real world, but there also is another one in Ice and Fire where Nefer, uh, the secret city Cliffs of Dover. You're thinking of the Cliffs of Dover. Dover. Okay, Cliffs of Cliffs Dover. Of Dover. Uh, is that in? Is that in a song? That's in a song, right? George loves referencing songs from the '60s. So somebody help me out. Eric Johnson. Okay. Yeah, what what's what is the story of the White Cliffs of Dover? That's probably the reference to Salt Cliff. Uh, maybe that's just like history. Is is that part of where, like the Saxons crossed over or something? Was there some battles there? They're made of chalk. Come here, girl. You can't perch on the microphone. Fuck. Yeah, Eric Johnson is a shredder. Exactly. Yeah, he's a, he's a good. He's a sh If George is referencing Eric Johnson, I'll be pfft, I'll have to run that by Maynard James Plum and see what he thinks about that. Anyway, let's keep moving. But uh, the Salt Cliff <laughs> mystery remains. Yeah, the Donner Party, obviously, also Jojo Paste and stuff. I think it's more Thunder here uh, because, again, it's Ironborn mythology. So, Oh, Tim, we're going on to a new island set. Okay, making progress, making progress. We're going to do Black Tide and Orkmont. It's just three houses involved here. Black Tide is Black Tide. And Orkmont has um, 
Orc Wood, and what's this other one with the flails of nettles? That's uh, House Tawny. Uh, Tawny, yes. House Tawny. Okay. So this is by Stefan Kapinski. It's Asha on the right, and that's Baylor Black Tide. Rest in peace. And his sable cloak on the left. Remember in Terminator 2, where the, uh, the newer Terminator sees a guy, a cop on a, on a bike, and he looks at him, he's like, say, nice bike. And then the next scene, he's like riding the bike, and you're like, that cop is dead. Um, it's kind of like, you're on his nice cloak. Baylor Black type was drowned in a cask. I was like, oh, that's how Euron goes clothes shopping. Paid the iron price for that sable cloak. And now the sable cloak, the reason why I'm talking about the sable cloak is it's the important symbol of House Black Tide. Because the sable is a marten. It's a woodland creature that you make fur from. Those trappers. Uh, the Sami, by the way, were fur trappers. And so you, you make these sable cloak. It's actually very dark brown, but essentially looks like black, depending on the shimmer of the light. So it works to be a cloak of darkness, but it's a skin changer cloak of darkness is the point of the symbol. It's it shows you that Azor High puts on the cloak of darkness by becoming a skin changer, by wearing the skins of others. You know, the, the, the weirwood itself. Um, so the sable cloak is an important symbol. Now, the black tide is the same symbol. When you think of the black tide, this is the darkness that comes out of the sky. It is the, you know, the bleeding stars. It's an ocean of bleeding stars. Waves of black blood is really the key. Again, it goes back to that black blood symbol. Um, so let's see here. Let's go with this quote. <clears throat> Baylor Black Tide was more difficult to please. He sat by Victorian's elbow in his lamb's wool tunic of black and green very smooth-faced and comely, just like Euron. His cloak was sable and pinned with a silver seven-pointed star. Um, so again, the starry cloak is the darkness of the night, and it's got a star here pinning it, all right? So if you pull that star out of the sky, the darkness comes loose, if you will. Um, he had been eight years a hostage in Old Town and returned as a worshiper of the seven green land gods. Balin was mad, Aaron is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all, Lord Baylor said. What of you, Lord Captain? If I shout your name, will you make an end to this mad war? So Baylor Blacktide, he, um, he's cut into seven pieces. That's the crux. Oh, I've got that quote too. Okay, sorry. Though the priest was gone, his dire warnings lingered. That's Aaron, the priest. Victorian found himself remembering Baylor Blacktide's words as well. What I just read, Balaam was mad, Aaron madder, and Euron the maddest of them all. The young lord had tried to sail home after the king's moot, refusing to accept Euron as his liege. But the Iron Fleet had closed the bay, the habit of obedience was rooted deep in Victorian Greyjoy, and Euron, oh, and Euron wore the driftwood crown. Nightflyer was seized. Lord Blacktide delivered to the king in chains. Euron's mutes and mongrels had cut him into seven parts to feed the seven Greenland gods he worshipped. So, the Black Tide was cut into seven pieces for the green lands. What is the sigil? Black and green. So what's the picture here? What's the hieroglyphic picture? A black tide, a flood, washing over the green lands. Simple <laughs> as that. You can look at it as the mm -hmm. darkness that covered the land or all the tsunamis and floods that would have hit like the Arm of Dorn, uh, the, the Ironborn. It's all the black flood symbol. So yeah, it's we already knew that. Like the the black cloak is already the cloak of darkness that covers the world. That's easy. The sable layer gives you the skin changer layer because we know Azor High invaded the Weirwood Net and used the Green Seer magic mm -hmm. to do it. But this quote really makes it clear: Black Tide cut into seven pieces for the Green Lands. It's like yeah, the the Black mm -hmm. Tide given to the Green Lands. Who was it done by? Euron the evil Azor High figure, who now wears the black cloak of darkness. So, yeah. there you go. And the thing I want to add, what, where I got my idea for Black Tide was going back to what I had said about in Lovecraft, how the way the black stone gets, makes its way around is it's being transported from place to place by the Deep Ones. They're like smuggling it through the water 
So if we think of this, this black stone traveling through the water, guided by deep ones, that would literally be a black tide. And what happens everywhere that this black stone appears? Some kind of catastrophic disaster. Well, here in the Iron Islands, we have a black stone, the sea stone chair. And if we're talking about, well, what ha if the Iron Islands are really drowned remains of something that was once connected to the sea, then there becomes your catastrophic event. The sea stone chair, the black stone, it gets here, and now all of a sudden, <laughs> here's a huge calamity. And what does a squid do? What does it squirt? Black ink, which is a black tide. Black ink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, so the black tide would be the squid of the the would be like this the ink of the krakens and the black stone literally traveling through the water. Well, because that's the thing. Like everywhere that this black, everywhere that this oily black stone appears, something bad happens. Iron Islands, Ashai, uh, Yeen. Possibly Toad Isle. We don't. We're not given enough information. I just said that Toad Isle has very fishy-looking people, but we need then, more history um, on them. I'm sure, something bad always happens in the Basilisk Isles. Well, Sothorios is an entire disaster fallout zone. I mean, there's no fucking yeah. humans there hardly. Um, but also the, uh, uh, well, the Shai is an obvious disaster zone, and it's got the Black Stone. Um, even the Arm of Dorne has an island named Bloodstone, which isn't an oily black mm. stone, but it's the name of an oily black stone. And that's where a disaster happens. So yeah, that, that all tracks. Um, also, the title yes. Of so, a guy who worshipped it. Yeah. <laughs> Lord Blackwood, uh, Lord of the Dead Tree, a black raven cloak. Um, yeah, so. All right. Um, <laughs> that's why. You better not cause any damage. <laughs> so, oh, the Black Tide. Yeah, so just to give you a couple more Black Tide quotes tied to the Ironborn. Makoro, this is Makoro talking to Tyrion. Only their shadows, Makoro said. One most of all. A tall and twisted thing with one black eye and ten long arms sailing on a sea of blood. But that sea of blood is a sea of black blood, I assure you. And of course, Euron's blood eye, quote unquote, is a black eye shining with malice. Or here, a black eye with ten long arms. And I've got art to match this. Um, so there's, yeah, this is Euron by Sheb's art. It is literally titled One Black Eye Shining with Malice. That's his blood eye. Um, here is another one. Uh, Mrs. Melisandre. Visions danced before her, garlic, uh, gold and scarlet, flickering, forming and melting and dissolving into one another, strange shapes and terrifying and seductive. She saw the eyeless faces again, staring out at her from sockets, weeping blood. Then the towers by the sea, crumbling as the dark tide came sweeping over them, rising from the depths. So a dark tide rising from the depths over towers by the seas. Most people take this to be Old Town, and you're on attacking Old Town, using some dark flood magic rising from the depth sounds like a kraken so watch out for that but the point is the dark tide symbol probably tied to euron's attack and rising from the depths and the blood and the eyeless sockets so the sea of blood um euron also in uh the winds of winter dampair chapter the forsaken his the moon uh, leered with Euron's face floating on a black wine sea. So now the black sea tide of darkness is tied to what? The darkness, the liquid darkness that Euron drinks. He's literally drinking shade of the evening. It's liquid darkness. So the black tide, like he, he wears it. He wears Baylor black tides cloak mm -hmm. and drinks the black tide and sails around on a ship with a black sail. Like, he is the Black Tide. <laughs> yeah. And then currently, he has the entire island of Black Tide. Um, he has it surrounded with the Iron Fleet, making sure that no one's able to escape from it after he kills Baylor Black Tide. Um, gotcha. He's trying to... Yeah. to basic, it, It's more of a move to kind of stifle any rebellions because 
House Black Tide is is one that would definitely have a reason to rebel against him. And we haven't been given any more information about them after the death of Baylor, so we don't know how he he doesn't award any black tides with any shield island so there hasn't been a we haven't been given a way for Euron to try and win them back over to his side if he's ever going to try that so rather he's just kind of keeping them under his thumb right now and then here's another one that's uh uh that's and that's yeah that's more great symbolism also the black water rush it flows from the god's eye what have we said about the god's eye it's a symbol of the sun moon alignment from which the disaster comes. That's why Tywin makes the Riverlands awash in blood and flame all around the God's eye. It's a blood and fire. That's why the lake is like the sun and the Isle of Faces is like the moon with its faces on it. And yeah, the black tide flows from the God's eye, from the sun moon disaster. That's where it, it flows from. And it's sometimes the black water rush will freeze solid. That's even worse. Um, so then, okay, but remember I just said uh, Black Tide cut into seven pieces for the Green Lands. So that's like a flood washing over the Green Lands, right? Well, here's Renly's death scene. Renly, dressed like a green stag, representing the forest and nature and all that. The king stumbled into her arms. That's Brienne's arms. A sheet of blood creeping down the front of his armor, a dark red tide that drowned his green and gold. More candles guttered out. Renly tried to speak, but he was choking on his own blood. His legs collapsed and only Brienne's strength held him up. She threw her head back and screamed, wordless in anguish, the shadow. Something dark and evil had happened here, she knew, something that she could not begin to understand. Renly never cast that shadow. Death came in that door and blew the life out of him as swift as the wind snuffed out his candles. Uh, another word, uh, and another one, it says, evil flow, talking about the blood flow. But yeah, so there's the black tide, Drowning out the green and gold. So it's just showing you this corrupt darkness, Azor Ahai's black blood, all, you know, mm. whatever layer of the metaphor you want to choose, it's drowning out the green. So that's pretty, it's, it's, it's just a depiction like of the black tide sigil. Cleo, this is why. You and that shadow, it. and that shadow for Renly was sent by another king in yellow figure because it's coming from Stannis. Inverted Greyjoy colors. <laughs> right, just as Euron is Lord of the Black Tides. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Beautiful. And this, and this, that's the kind of stuff why we know this stuff isn't an accident. It's not just a spade, son. <laughs> and that's also like you got to look at it. Yeah, you got because you got to look at it from every angle, uh, up, down, right, left, and invert it. Like George does that all the time. He loves his parallels. Orkwood of Orkmont. What's with all the orcs in the wood, Tim? Are there monsters? <laughs> are there orcs in the wood? Is, if you think about a forest where there are monsters, like, oh, there's the haunted forest that's got whites and others in it. What if that's similar? Yeah. So this is one I was looking at because it's it's you don't because you don't really know where George is going. Is he, if he's drawing from orcs from Tolkien's orcs, or if he's drawing from the even older folklore that Tolkien himself had drawn from? Because Orkwood is on Orc Mont, um, so the orc, before not Tolkien's orcs, but the even older folklore is more of an Alpine folklore. We're talking like Central and Eastern Europe, the Alp, these mountainous regions, and the orc is originally a sort of mountain demon. And then Tolkien drew upon that folklore when creating his own orcs for Lord of the Rings. Well, the thing, I think it's just the rut loose idea of monsters in the woods and the others are the monsters in the woods. I don't, I think that's all it is. Um, now the, the orcs in Lord of the Rings used to be elves and the others mm -hmm. used to be elves. So that also works. And if you look at the pairing of orc wood and orc mont, a mont is a mound. Yeah. The others are the, the she. They're from the they're associated with the mounds. So basically the she are the people of the mounds in Irish folklore. The others are basically not really of the mounds, they're of the trees. But the trees are serving the place of the mounds. That's where the dead spirits reside. So here we have both ideas transposed. Orc mont, orc wood. 
the others, the orcs, they come from the woods, but they are inspired by the she who come from the mounds. And we see that when we go to the Barrowlands, there's tons of other language to tell you, like George would say, yeah, the people of the mounds, the she, that's, that's the others. So, the, other, the orcs have big mounds, you say. That's what I said. I said it. So, um, go, what do you got? Um, so go, let's you know, go Orkwood, uh, back, let's back up and, and talk about the, the island, the people or whatever you got on the house, the members of the house. Yeah. So Orkwood, uh, dark green pines on a field of yellow, Lord Allen Orkwood. Uh, he is known as the Orkwood of Orkmont. Because like, and that's like another shared thing that some Ironborn houses have with the North, like how in the Northern Mountain Clans, uh, there's the Wall, the Great John, uh, and they refer to Ned as the Ned. Ironborn houses do this too, like how Stonehouse is the order is the Stonehouse, and Orkwood does the same thing. Yeah, the, the Harlaw Ork also. Yeah, the Harlaw. So here we have the Orkwood. And currently, our Lord, our current Lord Orkwood, of course, supports Euron because, again, who's supporting Euron? Our moon, our moon draggers, our monsters, all of our dead men, like all the the truly like more monstrous and magic sigils and names, are the ones that are going with Euron. So a uh, good good catch by the chat. Um... And I thank you, Tim, for illustrating that. That's a line of thinking that I had totally not even thought uh, dawned on me there. Um, and yeah, that's just another great way that George uses the sigils to tell the story. Exactly. Um, Orkin, O-R-K-N, means seal, like the Orkney Islands or to the Seal Islands. So Orkmont and Orkwood, it's like, oh, there's seals in the woods. And seals are a very good symbol of fish people. Not only because we have the walrus men and the seal skins and stuff, uh, but because seals look kind of like people. There are vaguely people like they could stand up and stuff. Asha is married. Um, they marry a seal at Asha's place to Eric Ironmaker. Um, and then of course, seals are prized for their skins. So you get the skin changing element. So, uh, yeah, Devin Seal Skinner is, is the name of somebody. So, yeah, uh, Seal Wood or Seal Mont, that just further associates skin changing and squishers, green seeing and fish. And that's a lot of what the Iron Islands is about. You know, this house of sigil is a forest, but we're talking about, obviously, Ironborn. Uh, so, yeah, that works really well. Thank you, Carl Karsnark, for that. The Selkies, so that's what I was trying to say. Yes, the Selkies. Those are the seal, the seal squishers are selkies. That's right. So one thought that I did have with this is that if we were to go and bring up that map of the Iron Islands, and if we were to Which sort I could of do. trace, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, Which one you want? Uh, the one with just all the all the islands. Oh, all the islands. Okay, hang on. Like if you just keep talking, back I'll out get so it. We well, if you were, if we think of the Iron Islands and we were trying to piece this back together as one solid piece, like these are the remains of a once drowned land. If you were to draw a line around them and start trying to connect them and then try and connect them back to the land, like by, by the Bainfort, you would get a shape that roughly looks like Europe. And the thing that George seems to be doing, like with Salt Cliff, it being like the White Cliffs of Dover, with Orkmont, how I just said, it's like the orc, uh, the the old folklore orc of being a mountain demon, alpine. That's like Austria. That's Germanic things. And then there's obviously the, the Norse aspect of Ironborn being Vikings. What you're getting is you're getting little different chunks of of Europe. But all parts that had that had huge Viking influence, the Norse, the Germanic lands, the British Isles. And this is what we're getting. So like I said, but if you were, so you get little pieces of Europe and if you were to try and connect the dots and make, turn it into a solid landmass, it would look like a little Europe. Hmm. That's interesting. You've been thinking about this map a lot, Tim. I like this. <laughs> yep. And then that's why also the Mossavi 
stuff that I talk about in my own stream with the Rus, because the Rus are also huge Vikings and the Baltics all very much touched by Vikings. Like they all fit in different ways in the our islands. It's like Europe on a, it's like Europe writ small with each individual island. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, cool. Thanks for bringing, thanks for bringing the extra knowledge. That's all I got to say about that. The artwork here is Aaron J. Riley. And the last one was Topo 83. No, I got that backwards. This is Aaron J. Riley. This is Topo 83. And of course, this is Waymar and Will. Will, by the way, did not climb a weirwood. I think it was a sentinel or a soldier pine, one or the other. Sentinel. But it was a sanded for a weirwood, so whatever. There's the other. The orc in the wood. House Tawny. Okay, now. Tawny means yellow to brown colored. And most people think of tawny and associated with the color of a lion, which of course is yellow to orange to brown in color. Tawny can be used to describe someone with blonde hair. Tawny headed, okay. Um, now here's the thing. House Tawny's sigil is a flail of nettles. Nettles. <laughs> and it doesn't, he can't make any sense of it except that Nettles is a brown dragon ridden by a brown girl. Or no, I'm sorry. Nettles is the brown girl. She rides the brown dragon sheep stealer. And mm -hmm. by the way, she, literally that's, it's kind of coarse. That's the language in the story. A brown girl on a brown dragon. So that's why I, I called her that. That's how she's described. But Tawny is the point. You got to think a brown dragon, as is drawn here by Ertach Altanaz, will have tan color and a little gold and this and that, because some of the scales are going to shine. Shiny brown is just dingy gold. Okay. So the Tawny Dragon is ridden by Nettles. And House Tawny, their sigil is a flail of Nettles. What does it mean? Fuck if I know. I have no idea. But it's obviously like a connection. Now, the only thing I got for you here is that the flail of nettles, it's a torture device. Nettles make you itch really bad. So if you whip somebody with nettles, that's like just like a horrific sort of way of, it's a skin, skinning kind of torture. So you, you can connect it to skinning and skin changing, um, mm -hmm. just like all the seal skinning and all that other stuff. Uh, but I have no idea why this parallel is, is created. Um, there's the only, the tawny that we have in the story is Linwood Tawny, or Lenwood Tawny. The name Lenwood is a variation of Linwood, which means river in the woods. So like a lot of these ironborn names, they sound like first man names in that they like, they mean stuff like forest and, you know, just really basic topography stuff. So what you got for me there? Um, so like, so Lenwood Tawny, is a Victorian supporter and he's one of Victorian's captains. So he's currently, uh, he's currently one of the, one of the captains sailing with Victorian out to Slaver's Bay. So when we think of like Nettles, the brown girl on a brown dragon, but then we think of Slaver's Bay, the obvious, you get the, it's hard to say, but there becomes the obvious racial implications there. Um, especially if we're thinking of the show, which was more of a geographical thing because they're filming in Morocco. In the books, it's not so much because slaves can come from anywhere in Essos. But I think there tends, I think, but there tends to be in the mind's eye, slaver, uh, the position of slavers, especially out in Slavers Bay, tend to be darker skinned. That these were people that would look like nettles. And yet here's the guy with the nettles is heading to that area where people who would have more of the skin skin complexion of the nettles we know from fire and blood would be more would be living rather than the iron islands who are very pale. I'm not sure I followed that, Tim, to be honest. <laughs> I was, mm. um, what What was the bottom line on that? It's more about the fact that the guy with nettles is he the the one guy with nettles in his name 
is heading to a la- is heading to a land with Victarian where you were more likely to find darker skinned people like metals from fire and blood. Oh, may- maybe he'll have something to do with one of the dragons that gets when the horn is blown. Maybe that's why he's setting it up. Hmm. If this guy is with Victarian. Um, the line that he's in, it says, Little Lenwood Tawny fiddled while Romney Weaver sang The Bloody Cup and Steel Rain and other old reaving songs. Now, Steel Rain is, you know, Moon Meteor Rain. That's the storm of bleeding stars and stuff. Um, but he's, he's so he's fiddling. So there's the music symbolism. But yeah, I just... I just didn't really have anything for this other than that connection to Nettles. So it may be something that George has set up but just hasn't used yet. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, like a lot, a lot of these lesser talked about Ironborn houses could be just like in wait, like they're just waiting to pounce. Like they're things that George is saving and he'll find use for them when when the time comes. You're muted again. Yeah, it's all I can say is just to point out the Nettles connection, and we'll see if he does something with it. It's obviously a parallel, but yeah, just can't say what it's what it's for yet. So, moving over to Great and Old Wick to conclude our tour of the Iron Islands. Oh, somebody said something funny in the chat while you were talking. Let me go back and find it. When Sheep Stealer screams, does it create brown noise? Barris Aurelius asks. I suppose <laughs> it would. <laughs> Danny's slave master whip that she throws aside is a cat of nine tails. So maybe there's some symbolism with the nine headed serpent and this flail. Hard to say. All right. Um, Great Wick and Old Wick. Used to be one island, potentially. But here they are. Here they are. So as you can see, there are horns everywhere. Um, Oh, I skipped over this. No, I didn't skip anything. I'm sorry. My notes are out of order, that's all. House, uh, good brother, where are they? Good brother, yes, here we are. It was long after dark by the time the priest espied the spiky iron battlements of the Hammerhorn. And that's the castle, the main castle of the Good Brothers. The spiky iron battlements of the Hammerhorn clawing at the crescent moon, Tim. Why is everything attacking the moon? It's such a mystery. Uh, Spiky iron battlements clawing. So now it sounds like dragon claws, iron claws. Um, but the main thing is that it's hammer horn keep. So remember, I said the trees are attacking the moon, and the horn is is spelled out as being able to, you know, bind the dragons, the moon meteor dragons, perhaps, and thereby bring down the wall and become the horn of winter, make the forest shake. Well, here, hammer horn is clawing at the moon, so it's a pretty good clue that the dragon binder horn or one of them horns can break the moon. And that's why the horn sounds like Nissa Nissa's scream, which cracked the moon. So it's all, it's definitely something to do with it. And this, the weird thing is the war horn sigil, it's a black horn banded in gold. So it approximately matches both the horn up north that Melisandre burned, that we don't think it burned, and Euron's dragonbinder horn, which is banded in Valerian steel and gold. So there's a few questions here. The symbolism's almost easier. The exciting part, like, ah, the hammer horn keep clawing at the moon, and the, and the horn looks like dragon binder, so one of those two black horns with gold bands must be an apocalypse horn that can help break the moon. That's like the big thing, but that's easy. The question is, why does House Goodbrother have this sigil? House Goodbrother goes back to the Dawn Age. The leal elder brother of the Grey King founded House Goodbrother. It's the only house on the Iron Islands not founded by the Grey King and his mermaid wife, House Good Brother. So, what do you have to say about the history of Good Brother, and why do you think 
Do you think George has like a reason? I mean, symbolism, it's obvious why the, the horn matches and how he can use it. And the dragon binder horn is blown on old wick. And here's Hammerhorn Keep on uh, Great Wick. Okay, so it's mm-hmm. like easy to see the parallel. But why do they have this sigil? Well, I'm a fan of uh, Disputed Lands, Crow Fu's daughter, her theory that the leal older brother of the Grey King is actually Garth the Green. And that goes in our Green King, Grey King symbol- symbiology, life and death, uh, spring, summer, winter, that type of thing, the, the reaping and the sowing. And for the good brothers to have that, to, to trace their ancestry more to Garth the Green rather than the Grey King, there the horn becomes more of like a horn of plenty type symbol, which Garth would symbolize being a guy, but even though he's more bigger in the reach, but for the Iron Islands to survive, even though they say like, oh, we do not sow and they don't farm and they don't, they don't do all this and that's all work for thralls. You, at the end of the day, someone needs to be bringing in some kind of source of food. So at one point, farming probably was something that was done on the Iron Islands, but it probably was when they weren't Iron Islands. It goes back to this idea of them being connected back to uh, to the Greenlands, originally being a part of them, not separate. And then with the other thing with the Good Brothers, their history is there's uh, Urathon Good Brother, who is the Bad Brother. Hold on. And that is how- Hold on before yeah. you do that. Um, I've got more for you on the Garth Good Brother idea. Um, the, the, the characters in... The characters now, they all have G names. Gorald, Gwyn, Graydon, Gormand, Gran, Gisela. Like. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Gormand in particular. Means Garmand. Uh, uh, let's see. Spear and Mund. And Corin means spear. I'm mean, Corin Volmark. I meant to say that. That's another one that like pike can be a fish. You know, sea dragon is a fish or a weapon. Pike is a spear or a fish. Um, Corin Volmark. His name is Spear Leviathan. Well, n- not Volmark doesn't mean Leviathan, but his sigil is Leviathan. He's named after a spear. So here, uh, yeah, Garmand means spear and protection. Very yeah. interesting. And then, because that sounds more like how something the house gardener would do, where we have all the Garths, Gwains, Giles, Garlands, Gareths, Gordons, like all the G names. Like that, that sounds more like a Greenlander thing, like house gardener, than it does an Ironborn. Yeah, Aaron looks at the good brother, um, it's Gormand, I believe, and he's like always afraid to get off his horse. He doesn't want to get his feet wet, you know, so this is a real Greenlander here. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're very fertile, as Crowfood's daughter points out, just like Garth the Green, like the Good Brothers. They're lots of kids, very fertile, and they've got houses everywhere. Um, Yeah. I think the other thing, Tim, is that along with the, the clustering of the houses, you're pointing out the clusters as far as like who they align with. What I'm noticing is that the ones here on Old Wick are going to give us the best weirwood clues because I think there used to be a weirwood culture on Wick specifically that's different than the Pike Lord Reaper culture, um, which I'm going to go into in my next video. But it begins here with Good Brother being a very fertile, Greenland-loving, Garth-affiliated house. Um, and they've got this horn, which yeah. the horn gets backed into like the horn, oh, the horn symbolism. You guys know the green men have horns. and uh, But the other... Go another ahead. Garth parallel. Another Garth parallel is this whole seed spreading thing. Because while House Harlaw has the most branch houses, all of them are still situated entirely on Harlaw. Whereas the Good Brothers, they have branch houses both on on Great Wick, but then they also have branch houses on two other islands. So they have spread like seeds. So that's like another another Garth Garth the Green, like spreading his wild oaks type symbolism 
the fact that the good brothers are kind of plotted all over the Iron Islands instead of being situated in one spot like the Harlaws are. That's an interesting observation, Tim. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, you know what? If some of you aren't seeing your posts, it's because I had it on top chat, not live chat. It, it's just YouTube algorithm bullshit. I just fixed it. Um, now there should be, they should all appear in order. I apologize if yours, I don't know what criteria it does that, but um, I prefer no algorithm. So here we are. We're on live chat now. Thanks for reminding me. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, oh, there's more with that quote. So the hammer horn clawing at the crescent moon, Gorold's keep was hulking and blocky. Its great stones quarried from the cliff that loomed behind it. Behind it, so it's part of the cliff. Um, below its walls, the entrances of caves and ancient mines yawned like toothless black mouths. The Hammerhorn's iron gates had been closed and barred for the night. Aaron beat on them with a rock until the clanging woke a guard. <coughs> <coughs> so the Hammerhorn that wakes the sleepers is a rock. Tim, you're supposed to talk when I disappear, buddy. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right. So, <clears throat> yes. Hulking and blocky. So it's a monster. Uh, the cave, cave mouths yawn like toothless black mouths. What's a toothless black mouth supposed to Is that like worms? Is that a deep one? No, deep ones have lots of teeth. Um. Definitely makes you think of, you know, caves, children of the forest and all that. But it's all kind of, yeah. I mean, the hammer horn is the main thing as far as the symbol goes. So I kind of tend to arrange all the other stuff around that. I don't know what the Hulk has. I guess the Hulk is a green man, right? That's what it is. The keep is <laughs> hulking. And so it's like, a, it's like it's a green man with a hammer horn and a toothless black mouth. Oh, toothless black mouth, black gate. Where would the black gate? It's a yawning cavity. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that would work. No teeth. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, very good. So that's house good brother. Um, and like I said, uh, dragon binder. A match for good brother. And they blew it on Old Wick and Good Brothers on Great Wick. So that's obviously intentional stuff. Here's another one. This artwork is by Yoan Boisonnet. This one is by Abe Papakian. Now, House Spar, there's no artwork for House Spar. The only time they come into the story is that first Dampere chapter where he comes in from the sea and gets word of Balin's death. It is the Spar who brings it to him. Uh, what do you have to say about House Spar, and what is this sigil even supposed to be? I actually had nothing on House Spar because I didn't even realize they had. I thought they were one of those houses that sigil hadn't hadn't appeared yet, and I left those out of my notes. But apparently, well, they have one. It's Oak semi canon Salty. sources, so. Uh, yeah. Does anybody have anything on Spar? I've got the whole scene. I don't think I think we're running out of time, so I don't want to read it. I had the whole scene where Aaron drowned the boy and uh, woke him up, and it's the main thing in there is just what I was saying about how Aaron is thinking about how they're afraid to get off their horses, and um, one of the things that's interesting is he drowns the boy and resurrects them, and then right after that they're like, yeah, the king is dead, so it's like who's the king of the Iron Islands? You know, originally a drowned man, perhaps um, yeah. somebody that came out of the sea. So this is another one of those houses where the Lord is the title. So it's, he is the spar and let's see. And they're Victorian supporters. And I am sure to notice that the sigils of just how I, we noted like the sigils of the houses that are supporting Euron are like the more dead and monstrous ones. The sigils of the houses that are Victorian supporters seem to be more natural, like yeah. Tawny and and hear how spar like oh and this they're... is another spear too just like corn volmark yeah. and the last one that meant spear 
they're like um, weapons but made gold. from yeah all the all the victorian supporter houses their their sigils are more weapons rather than monsters which would go which would go well with victorian's nature as a warrior that's cool well, it just makes me think of pike and the whole line of thinking where these all these spears like they're talking about you know the meteor spear in my opinion the sea dragon fishy pike weapon etc etc okay a Roderick spar so that's another um that's another like just kingly name okay and i guess they probably build ships yeah that's probably the um because a spar is a is a ship. It's a wooden segment used in shipbuilding, and that's why their their sigil is a wooden cross. So yeah, they're probably building ships out there. That makes sense. Somebody's got to build ships. So yeah, um, and remember the sea dragon. It's on one level. It's a boat. It's a ship, but it's also like a spear, like a pike, in the in that it's also describing a meteor attack. So hmm. there we go. I guess. I guess what we're getting at here is, um, so you just said, like the spars are shipbuilders, and the good brothers, their wealth comes from mining. But mining is something that the ironborn see as beneath them. Like, oh, that's only work for thralls. But the good brothers are more willing to do it, which seems like a more Greenlander aspect. But I think at the end of the day, it's more like, no, eventually somebody has to do some real work. And an economy cannot rely on thievery alone. Someone somewhere has to be doing an actual job. It can't all be left to thralls. And that's what it seems like the good brothers and the spars are getting at here. Right, which is, again, different from the theft-based culture on Pike. Yeah. And <laughs> when I say the two different cultures, like... On Old Wick, we have this Grey King weirwood stuff, and the throne is made of wood. It's pale. Everything is pale. Pale crown, pale throne. Over on Pike, they wear black crowns and sit on a black throne and steal everything. On Wick, they make decrees about Ironborn not killing each other. And on Pike, you know, you're on Drown's friggin' uh, he he cuts Baylor Black Tide into pieces. Doesn't he drown somebody else? Oh, Christopher's dad. So, yeah, Sawain Botley. Yeah, that's who it was. Oh, and I had the translation for Sawain up. up uh, let me go back for this. Sawain is, comes from Swain. It's a Norse word that means pleasant or able. Tristan, however, means sad or melancholy. Okay, like <laughs> Tristan and uh, Assault. Um, Tristan is a tragic character. So Tristan, who can't, Always trying to get with Asha, always being rejected. He's a sad, melancholy Botley. And Sawain Botley, he was pleasant and able. Unfortunately, he was drowned. I, I don't know what the... It's just interesting sort of commentary. You know, dad's pleasant, son is melancholy. There it is. Um, there was one other translation I had that I... Oh, it was the corn spear one. I went back for that. Okay, I got that. Um, where were we? Uh, oh, it's time for House Drum. Yes. Oh, this art, by the way, is Arden Beckwith. And obviously that's Aaron Dampere. So this art, this is not Dagon Drum. This is some sort of Necromancer King artwork by Ludwig SKP. But of course, Dagon Drum, the Necromancer is presumably a necromancer and maybe he was just really good at the drowned man thing or maybe he was doing the patch face you know the original version of water resurrections and that was his necromancy we will not we will never know but house drum some great symbolism uh, i'll turn you loose first on house drum what do you have to say okay so house drum one of the more storied houses like we get a lot of names and they're all very menacing. We got Dagon Drum the Necromancer, Regnar Drum the Raven Feeder, Dale the Dread, Roar and the Reaver, Gorman the Old Father, Hilmar the Cunning. And then uh, one of the things is that the name may be a reference to Jericho Drum, who is a, a, a superhero known as Voodoo Brother. 
uh, which because George does draw upon uh, old DC and Marvel comics, and that would fit well with them being more like a voodoo type. That fits with the Dagon Drum necromancer vibe that we get across there. Uh, they're also the other the other Ironborn house to have a Valyrian steel sword. They have Red Rain, which may or may not have been taken from House Rain, Westerlin's family. The Ironborn are constantly raiding the Westerlin, so. Seems like a good uh, seems like a good possibility that that's where it came from, uh, and then their leader is another one of these. The t- he is the drum, and Lord Dunstan actually throws in his own hat. Dunstan drums the current Lord of House Drum, and he throws his own hat into the King's moot. And but he tries to. When we read that chapter, I had commented he's he's kind of running on a nostalgia trip, talking about when the drums were great, and that. But he, as for his actual, uh, what he can bring to the Ironborn now, the gifts he's uh, giving them are looked upon as paltry. And that's why he's sort of drowned out. And that's when we start being like, okay, who are who are the our real contenders in this? And it's, of course, the Greyjoys. They kind of give off that vibe of like, that Bolton vibe of second great house. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Um one thing, Hrothgar of, um, oh, that's not a drum. There is a Hrothgar of Pike who had a Kraken summoning horn. There's another, there's a Kraken summoning horn on Celtigar too, isn't there? Supposedly. Yeah. Yeah, which is probably something the Iron Islanders would love to get their hands on. Well, the point is it might be a real thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, maybe Euron could have that. Maybe he's got one. Um, see, Ragged Ralph, uh, Dagon Drum the Necromancer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we already mentioned that. So the thing about drum symbolism is it's weirwood symbolism. Bone hand on a blood red field. Well, the weirwoods are bone white uh, trunks and then bloody hand, blood red leaves like hands. So... Yeah, and the weirwoods obviously can be used for necromancy. Um, the drumming is like the heartbeat of the weirwoods. We know that because Theon is in the God's Wood, and uh, he's hearing the boom, doom, boom, doom drums outside. But then it becomes the heartbeat of the weirwood as Bran talks to him. Uh, John hears it in his Azor High dream. So this drumming seems to have something to do with like a, the idea of a heartbeat. And so Dagon drum the necromancer with the with the it's called the bone hand. Um, yeah, this is this is weirwood stuff that might be turning into other stuff. Hard to say if it's meant to be others because the necromancy, like you know the the green zombies, that's not other stuff, and those are weirwood zombies. So that's a whole thing. Um, yeah, and probably not. A, and John, of course, is going to be probably a, a partially a weirwood zombie. When he is raised, Let's see, will have been necromanced. <clears throat> the drums call the Balrog. The John is the Balrog. Yeah, he's Darth Vader. And <laughs> politically wise, House Drums another one of these houses that Euron's trying to undermine. Because uh, Dunstan Drum, the current Lord, he has a champion that is Andric the Unsmiling, and Andric is one of these other people that uh, Euron awards a shield island to because he is removing Dunstan Drum's strong right hand. And that is because, and that goes back to the drums having uh, a legitimate claim to the iron, to not the iron, I was about to say iron throne, to the sea stone chair because of how many times drums were high kings. And Dunstan Drum is essentially known as the Lord of Old Wick, not just like his holding on Old Wick, the entire island because they just like how black tide is like the house black tide is the major major house on black tide the literally the only house drum is sort of the same way on old wick because there's only aside from oh damn it damon <laughs> uh because aside from the drums we really only get one other house on old wick and that is house stone house so the drum seems to be more like Lord of the entire island rather than just a small holding of it. 
Yeah, well, the uh, the far winds have a, a castle on the corner too, but yes, you're not wrong. Um, also, Rado points out the drumming, the rowers of a long ship. That's probably the drumming that is meant like in the literal plot, like house drum, probably the drum they're thinking of is the drumming of, of the oarsmen. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for putting that in. We skipped right over that. Um, Dave, Damon, you're the true black tide today because you are a terror. <laughs> but we, ha but we have seen that, like when Stannis attacked the Blackwater, we see that weirwood <laughs> ship metaphor in, like it's in full blast. There's all of the, uh, the Valarion ships are like seahorses, and and uh, and there, there's point is there's the there's a drum beating out the cadence for that attack, and Davos hears it as a thousand hearts beating as one, so it's. It's a heartbeat, it's the drumming, and it's literally the heartbeat. Like, the thousand hearts are the thousand ships. So it's like, yeah, the ship, the wooden ships sailing the sea, they represent the weirwoods. So this is the, the heartbeat of the entire weirwood net that is being drummed out. So yeah. And because and Old Wick is where Naga's bones are. So for the drums to essentially be like the lords of the entire island, it's like saying they're the lords of the religious center of the Iron Islands by being where Naga's, Naga's bones are. So it makes all the more sense why Euron would want to undermine them. He sees them as why he sees them as a threat. Yeah, they have a certain amount of prestige, even if they're not wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh... Oh, I've kind of mixed this up here. Sorry. Oh, that's oh, that's because I dragged the map up. No wonder. Okay, sorry. So next up is Merlin. And let me go back to our map so we can see this one more time. Okay, so there's the good brothers all over the middle. Um, drum is over here, we think. There's not... We actually don't know where the castle of House Drum is. Um... That is one thing I noticed when we looked up. I'll look it up again, but I don't think it's said. And I think that the other map I looked at was talking about having to guess. Yeah, it just says... Um, House drum of Old Wick, like essentially the entire island of Old Wick is just theirs. <laughs> Aside from those two corners. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't say. And then there's Merlin of Pebbleton, which we're about to talk about. Um, and the spar, I put the spar down here because it's six leagues, which is 18 miles, from the castle of the spar to the Hammerhorn. Aaron rides it on the horse. The Hammerhorn is the closest castle to wherever the spar is. And the spar is on the ocean because that's where Aaron is. So it's got to be in a spot on the ocean, relatively close to the Hammerhorn, where the Hammerhorn is still is the closest castle. So it's got to be somewhere on that uh, southwest coast where I've got the sigil. Um, now House Merlin, they are on Pebbleton and their sigil is the twinning water spouts. And here I found a photo of twin water spouts for you. And so we just said, um, what do we say about House Merlin? Um, we didn't really say much about them. Uh, no, but we figured out the clue about what it's about, the water spouts. <clears throat> oh, the Roynar. I figured there's... The Roynar. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because the they're like symbolizing cyclones or tornadoes. So if we're thinking of like the Roynar water magic and raising up like water spouts and water walls. And then here we have House like Merlin with the water yeah. spouts. So that's just telling you there is a water magic that can control the waves. Um, could yeah, we... you would think you would think it would be more obvious that we should just think of Mer of uh, Merlin from like King Arthur tales? Yeah, yeah. which just means magician. So yeah. that's just, that's why I said House Merlin, uh, House of Magicians, makes twin water spouts, and we just read the section where the Roynish water wizards could summon walls of water, raise them up out of the river to defend. So there is water magic and but then also yeah they're twining water spouts. So now they look like yeah, a helix or twinning serpents, the caduceus. 
basically it brings a snake element to it. So now it looks like two sea serpents rising out of the sea. So that's probably sea dragon stuff. And then, yeah, Merlin King. Also Merlin, Merling. So House Merling. Um, twinning. I, what, what's the Merling layer here? Well, they support, so Lord Meldred Merwin, uh, Merlin, I said Merwin. So he supports Asha. So going back to these sigils and the houses that support them, Euron's the monsters, Victarion's got the weapons ones, the sigils of the houses that are supporting Asha. So Merlin, Botley, and her uncle Roderick the Reader Harlaw. These are the houses that seem to be representing knowledge and magic. They're the ones that are that are supporting Asha. So I think that's where we're looking for the theme here. We got our monster, our warrior, and our our Asha representing a new a new way, one where the Ironborn are more learn are more learned, something that Roderick uh, encompasses, but something that Ironborn culture for the most part seems to be. Um, Chafe, to chafe against it, it goes completely against what they believe ironborn should be and that is essentially what asha once is trying to achieve in her king's moot is take the ironborn in a new direction but as we know with like uh progressive politics change is hard it, do it doesn't happen overnight it's very slow especially when you got a society for a society like the ironborn Ooh. Sorry, Tim. I got a good one. <clears throat> ah. Everyone's saying Merlins are also birds. Um, but I don't know what that would have to do with anything. Here. I would think more of the association is uh, Merlin the Magician and Merlings. But maybe someone can connect the, connect the link there. Um, okay, so I think this is mostly just talking about water magic. That wasn't a dab. That was actually a, yeah, the other thing. Here is yeah, you're okay. How so? So this is Aaron. When he woke, the day was bright and windy. Aaron broke his fast on a broth of clams and seaweed cooked above a driftwood fire. Cleo, you can't perch there. <laughs> above a driftwood fire. No sooner had he finished than the Merlin descended from his tower house with half a dozen guards to seek him out. The king is dead, the damp hair told him. Aye, I had a bird, and now another. The Merlin was a bald, round, fleshy man who styled himself lord in the manner of the Greenlands and dressed in furs and velvets. One raven summons me to pike, another to ten towers. You krakens have too many arms, you pull a man to pieces. What say you, priest? Where should I send my longships? So there's a few interesting things here. One, the goddamn squishers are bald and fleshy. And here, the merlin is a bald, fleshy man. So I just, you know, keep it consistent. So it's, it's definitely implying him as a Merling. And it's just saying, calling him the Merlin, it's just like the Merling descended from the hill, just talking about him as a creature, you know. So that was cool. And what's his first name, Tim? Uh, where? Meldred. Meldred. That's a weird one. Meaning, it's a horrible name, Mildred. Apologies if anyone has that name. Um, it's just giving me Mildred, but that's probably gentle well, again, strength. I think... It doesn't matter. This doesn't make sense. Well, so I, again, I think it goes to show, like when we're looking at who's supporting who, and the way that they preside, and the way that they would rule the Iron Islands. You're on yeah. having. Going through oh. with violence and black magic, okay. so it makes sense that his are the monstrous. Your a Victorian's idea of ruling the Iron Islands is more of the same. Keep doing what we've been doing. Keep keep on keeping on. That's why the supporters of him are the warriors, the spearmen, the 
the iron the what we see as ironborn and then asha supporters merlin Har uh harla botley they're the ones though that are also seen in ironborn eyes as being more a feminine which we kind of can see with a name like meldred for a man not just saying it, it when you say like you look it up and what are the results you get mildred i think george is being very deliberate with this type of name it gives you a certain sense of who is supporting asha i think uh, that's it yeah that makes sense yeah and that's what it would a lot be of these, like, yeah. like rod we've got a couple of rodericks there's a rodrick drum too and rodrick means like you know wise ruler or whatever it was famous ruler so yeah that makes sense yeah. like if we were talking memes, Asha supporters are a bunch of Wojaks. Like, that's really what it is. I think that's the the picture we're painting. I don't, well, okay. I mean. The so, it, it's more like the, the soy boy meme. That's Tim, who supports Asha. growing stuff is woke <laughs> on the Iron Islands, okay? Like, growing things. You woke pansy. Like, I'm just farming. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing about this, okay, so the, the bird part. You guys mentioned Merlin's a bird. It said the Merlin, I, um, I had a bird last night and now another. So to me, it sounds like a squisher eating birds. Like, oh, yeah, I had a bird last night. I had another just now. I'm eating birds. I'll eat anything. I'm a damn squisher. Um, but for the extent that Merlin means bird, like, he's, like he has birds. He is a bird. He's, he's a bird master. Bird man, man, man. Okay, so there you go. And then uh, how Stonehouse. Obviously, the Stonehouse is Naga's ribs. And there's a, the sigil has a fire in the Stonehouse because the Grey King possessed Naga's fire and it warmed Naga's hall. This would be gobsmacking, except for that we've already explained this five different ways on this stream. Um, that Naga's, you know, ribs are a weirwood hall and they turn to stone and living fire is the weirwood magic. So stone house is just more, basically it's a compliment to the stone tree symbolism, but it's just telling you it's, it's a house where you can live and it has fire in it. Um, the captains and kings made their way up the slopes. Aaron Dampere saw a cheerful Siegfried stone tree. By the way, Siegfried... Siegfried is a dragon slayer in Norse myth, is he not? Yes, he is. Yes, Siegfried. That's interesting. Andric the Unsmiling, the Knight Sir Harris Harlaw, Lord Baylor Blacktide in his sable cloak, stood beside the stone house in ragged seal skin. So again, the stone house. The lord of the stone house is called the stone house. And he's cloaked in ragged seal skin. And Nice contrast, right? Baylor Black Tide, Sable Fancy Cloak. And then you have this guy, the Stone House, from Old Wick, dressed in seal skins. So he sounds like he might be friends with the Far Winds. And he's definitely a throwback. And again, skin changing symbolism for all the people on the Isle of Wick. Heavy, heavy skin changing symbolism. Here we've got. And again, the Spars build ships. The Weirwoods are the, the ships that the Greensayers uh, sail. So that's a heavy Greenseer clue. And then, yeah, here's Stonehouse, the Stonehouse in Ragged Sealskin. So he's um, a, he's a, he wears skins. He's a skin changer. He's a, he might be a, a Selkie, a, you know, a, a seal man. And uh, it's also just cool because, again, it's just such a throwback. Some of the Ironborn are dressed like lords. And some of them are wearing freaking seal skins. Like, this is a centuries and centuries gap in fashion here. It's not just like, that's not just retro <laughs> versus modern. Like, we're talking somebody showed up at a caveman's loincloth and the other guy's wearing like medieval finery, you know? It's yeah. wild. Anyways. Um do you have any quotes in regards to Victorian getting his fire hand? Is there any mention of a brazier when that happens to him? Uh, probably. Why? Because House Stonehouse are Victorian supporters. Um, Red Ralph Stonehouse. He's one of two Ralphs, actually. So there's Red Ralph Stonehouse and Ralph Kenning, 
Uh, they both vic urge Victarion to make his claim after Balin's death. So again, trying to connect sigils and who they support it. A braze Stonehouse being Victarion supporters with the Brazier could be con and connections to him obtaining his fire hand. Yes. There's a brazier, like when McCormick's Even doing the smallest it. <laughs> scratch can prove mortal, Lord Captain, but if you will allow me, I will heal this. I will need a blade. Silver would be best, but iron will serve. A brazier as well. I must needs light a fire. There will be pain. Terrible pain such as, such as you have never known. But when we are done, your hand will be returned to you. Of course, Victorian says, They're all the same, these magic men. The mouse warned me of pains as well. I am Ironborn Priest. I laugh at pain. You will have what you require. But if you fail and my hand is not healed, I will cut your throat myself and give you to the sea. Anyway. So. There's your brazier. Yep. So, yeah, that's just... This just proving me more and more that uh, it was... It, it made so much sense to look for who these houses support because they're all they all have these connections and there's yep victorian supporters the brazier and it goes into his his fire hand and again st and it's a stone house and a kenning who's uh the st their sigil is the storm god striking lightning they're the ones that are really they are the first to push victorian you need to make a claim they're the ones telling him like after balan dies you need to be king that is so interesting, Tim. I'm really like, you can see that there are multiple ways that George is using these sigils as hieroglyphs to tell a story. It's not just the long night sort of sentences that he makes about the moon disaster. Yeah, this is really fascinating, Tim. See, this is, you should make another video about just this, be like the grouping of the Ironborn sigils behind the three things like it makes sense like this is really detailed and it it doesn't lead to a great theory it's just really friggin interesting um, yeah it's it just it's more about their personalities really yeah. than any sort of theory yeah. about who supports who like and you get it expands a on the whole king's Muth concept yeah as a contest of ideas about how to govern yeah what different iron board houses hold uh consider important to them which is how normally in, in a functional society is how you should decide your vote which candidate best aligns with my views real quick james um uh the the academic apostate are you familiar with elden ring not familiar but i know that they're <laughs> elden ring is uh created by george martin and What's the name of the, the Japanese uh, video game maker that worked on that one? I can't remember his name. I can almost hear it in my head. Anyways, he collaborated with one other person. It's, it's the other guy is the guy that did Dark Souls. And there's a ton of stuff in Elden Ring, which sounds like my theories, like the moon meteor stuff and deep weird with net stuff. Obviously, George is reusing some ideas. Some of that stuff is probably just fantasy archetype stuff, but... Um, at this point, there are name, uh, there are probably videos about just the Elden Ring lore. I was thinking to play it so I could explore the lore, but it's a really hard game. Miyazaki, yeah, Miyazaki. Miyazaki. Um, so, yeah, I'll have to. I've just been slacking on it. I need to watch a couple of videos about the Elden Ring lore so I can talk about it because there is some. It does seem like there are some potential. I wouldn't call it confirmation. But clues that some of the things that we're talking about are barking up the right tree. So thanks for reminding me about that, Jay Hanna. And I do need to do that. And yeah, thanks to everyone who sent in PayPal's today. Appreciate that. So just a couple more to go, Tim. I will just pop the map back up here. Oh, that's the big map. Sorry. So up at speaking of seal skins. So, okay. So look at Shatterstone. On the north of Old Wick, that's where Stonehouse is, the guy that dresses in seal skins. So over on the north tip of Great Wick is Sealskin Point. This is actually the larger holding of House Farwind. House Farwind of the Lonely Light is like a cadet branch or something, um, mm. or related Lonely branch. Lunch. It's 
fake farwins lonely light are the true farwins <laughs> yeah thank you thank you um we'll talk about that but seal skin point uh so and then of course obviously the farwins they've got the mad color changing eyes and they might skin change walruses or maybe their selkies so this is all of a piece and let's go to see the thing is house farwind well, we don't really care about Seal Skin Point. This is just an excuse to talk about the far ones of the Lonely Light. See, they're so far out, Tim. They're almost to the edge of the world. They got to be careful. If they keep sailing past the Lonely Light, they will fall off, get eaten by the <laughs> Chaos Dragon. Um, so that's a concern. And, of course, their sigil, House Far Wind. Their sigil is literally the picture of a ship sailing against a setting sun. And they believe the they come from a land across the sunset sea. So their sigil expresses that belief that like, it's mm. like you're looking off to the West and there's a ship on the horizon. Where'd it come from? The land across the sunset sea. So mm -hmm. that's the sigil. Um, I was just going to let you read the speech again, man. I mean, I, we could just talk about it if you want. It's pretty long streams. Maybe we don't need to read it, but <laughs> <laughs> you just want me to do the the voice. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say the one line. Uh, Make me your king, and I shall lead you there. There, that's all. That's all we need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go back to which one was that on? It was. I think we read the King's Moot chapter. Yeah, we read the King's Moot chapter, and I've done it a couple of times in my own streams. Anytime, and I, I do it, you know, at home to my family once a week, and you know, Sunday breakfast. <laughs> and like, don't tell me someone's name is Gilbert. I can't not do the voice. Gilbert Farwind. Okay, so have we ever looked up the meaning of the name Gilbert? Uh, let's look up. Gilbert. Bright Promise. What do you oh, mean? Bright Promise. That makes sense. He's promising that they'll sail across the sea at every... Everybody will be a lord and a, a queen and all that. It's that's perfect. <laughs> it's very very sunny, promising that he's doing. That's funny. So yeah, how's Farwind? Now, I will go ahead. If you've been listening to this live stream for all, I will give away one of my big reveals that I'm saving for my uh, next Ironborn video. We are four hours, Tim, into this. <laughs> Ironborn sigil icebergish thing. The far winds, folks. They did not come from the Iron Islands. They the, the the lonely light was not settled by people coming from the Iron Islands. It is the other way around. If people sailed, and let me get this map here. If people sailed to Westeros across the Sunset Sea they would get to the Lonely Light first. They would follow seabirds and other things, and they would find the Lonely Light before they ever found Westeros. And they'd probably wonder if there was anything beyond, and some of them would want to turn back. Some people would be injured and sick because they'd been sailing across the sea for months. And what they would do, some of the people would stay on the island and set up a little base and tend for the wounded and all that. And most of the other people would keep sailing and they would have then got to the Iron Islands and settled it on Wick. Wick, as you'll notice, the next island you come to, and that's the one where all the Grey King stuff is attached to. Wick. <clears throat> and so the Lonely Light people, with their weird color-changing eyes and some combination of silkiness or skin-changing magic, they represent more like what the original ancient mariners that came to the island islands would have looked like and acted like. This is the theory. I think it makes a lot more sense than them migrating out there and just being weird. Now, Tim, there is a theory mm -hmm. that the one Stark who sailed into the Sunset Sea and was never seen again, he went to the Lonely Light and spread his skin-changing genes to the Ironborn there, and that's why the Firewinds are weird. That's creative, but it doesn't really line up if you look at the map. If you're sailing west from Winterfell, mm -hmm. you know, like from Sea Dragon Point or somewhere, you're not going to yeah. run into the Lonely Light. It's way far south. No. 
So that doesn't really Yeah, you're make diverting. Sense. You're going way out of your way south. Like, you got to be completely lost and not know west from south to wind up in lonely light from north. <laughs> yeah, so that doesn't hold for me. Um, this, I think this just what broken. I was... Go ahead. So get, yeah, give your thoughts on that idea, that, that it's the first place that the Mariners hit. Yeah, like, um, well, I would say the first place that they hit would be those three islands named after the Conquerors where the pigs and the, where the, pigs and the Komodo dragons are. That seems like your first stop off point. And it's like, okay, these are little islands. Let's leave some, because you leave just a few breeding pairs of pigs. They only need, they need just a short amount of time before there's a population explosion and pigs are hardy. They can live anywhere. Like you talk to someone who lives in the Southern U S like wild hogs are a legitimate issue because of how rampant they are. Um, so that seems like the, one of the first stops. But then, as you said, like you continue on, finally you get to lonely light and then you are going to have people who are going to be like, I can't do this anymore. I need to get off this boat. I'm going stir crazy. I'm sick. Like, let me off. And that becomes like, okay, we'll drop you off the next time we see land. That's lonely light. But then others who are still willing to brave the journey, they're the ones that continue on, even continue sailing until finally they reach Great Wick. So yeah, it definitely seems like if, if we're thinking of people leaving the far east of Essos, sailing east, and then east eventually becoming west, Lonely Light seems like one of the places where like, yeah, this was a stopping point, but people got off because they're because they just couldn't take sailing anymore. And they just made what they, they just did what they could with the land they were on and made the best of it. And the biggest takeaway from that is that they look more like the original immigrants from the Great Empire of the Dawn area, Carcosa, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and that they yes. seem to be skin changers. Their eyes are shifting colors. Remember the Great Empire of the Dawn? Gemstone emperors, they're known by their different colored eyes, named after gems. So they're colorful and they change. They don't change, but I mean the different um, emperors have different eye colors. So those color changing eyes and the potential idea that they're skin changers is another clue that the Great Empire of the Dawn, you know, along with the Weirwood Arc, maybe already had Weirwoods and skin changer magic when they came here. So, yeah. And remember, some of these people could be the old ones from Lang, who are green men, potentially. So that would make sense as well, that there's... Like, we already know there is skin changer magic out there, if I'm right about the old ones from Lang being green men. So... I and think it, it so gives a lot. Reason. I apologize. What? And it gives, it gives reason as to why the Iron Islands are still, despite all being, considering themselves ironborn, are still not such a cohesive society why they have like these major rifts between them because if they're all fleeing from the east but they're just originally refugees from different parts of the empire all just leaving from the same spot it makes sense that they would have their own different beliefs and different outlooks and that creates this bit of diversity even among these most xenophobic people i kind of liked that wick means town or settlement and so old wick means old town it's like <laughs> possibly settled by the same people. Like that's that's pretty funny. I like yeah. that. Um, okay, and so I think that's probably all we have to say about House Far Wind. It's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good stuff there. So that brings us to this fucker. You're on. Are we not going to talk about House Cod? <laughs> <laughs> I skipped them. <laughs> Where are they though? They must not have been on the map. We can talk about House Cod. Oh, I just don't have their. Um, let me pull it so, up real so quick. So I did have it in my notes. Here's here's a weird little tidbit with House Cod, right? So House Cod, their seat is unknown. We don't even know what island they're on. Yeah. But they are the only other Ironborn house besides the Greyjoys whose words are spoken. Though all men do despise us. So every island, we know where the island they're on. We know what the name of their keep. We don't know any of their words. House Cod, we know their words, but not where their keep, not where they're located at. Now, for me, I like to think that they're on Black Tide just because Black Tide need one Black Tide needs more houses. They literally only have one. There's House Black Tide on the island of Black Tide at Castle Black Tide. Like, 
George really phoned it in on that one with the naming scheme. So I, like I would it. put I think my head canon is that they're from Black Tide. The, I like it. The least the least respected house is on the least renowned island. And also it fits with the whole um squishers, deep ones moving the black stone, that being the black tide. Well, the cods are our most fishy like ironborn when we get the description of like Dagon Cod. I wouldn't mind them being on Pike just be for that reason. Because um, I feel like that's the squishiest place around. <laughs> Having the idol there. but What's the one with the storm gods? That's Kenning. So the interesting thing about Kenning is that, uh, and I'll pull up that sigil real quick. Kenning, of course, is a Norse term for a phrase that's basically a symbolic phrase. Uh, can you give an example of a kenning while I look this up? I just, I can't do two things at once. Yeah, so I brought up, Ra so the other Ralph, Ralph Kenning, he is the, uh, he is also urges Victorian to press his claim. Um, the Kennings are one of the houses on Harlaw, so they were one of the bitter rivals to the Harlaws in the past, but are now vassals to them. So what I'm trying to do is that they are the storm god, which wouldn't, and this is where like this kind of breaks apart though, because Ralph Kenning supports Victorian, but their sigil is literally the storm god, which is the enemy of their religion. So it would, you would think they would align with Euron in that respect. But Watch no, out for him Victarian. to switch sides then, dude. Right? Yeah, that is true. A lot of, because a lot of people do, it is noted that a lot of Victorian supporters do end up switching sides uh, after Euron's speech. People that were shouting Vic's name all of a sudden are now shouting Euron. So that could have been with the Kennings. And just this one specific individual, Ralph Kenning, is still on Vic's side. But the rest of the family isn't. Yeah, it's. I felt like George made a house Kenning just so we could know to think about Kennings and stuff like that. And that that's something he was drawing from. Um, Ken means to know or understand like awaken I think that's where that comes from that's interesting now let's see where's the it's uh, is Ralph Kenning at Mo Kalen is there Kenning at Mo Kalen Where is Ralph? Yeah, let's see. Where's Ralph Kenning at currently? Um, yep. Theon, sent by Ramsay Bolton, finds Ralph lying naked in his bed. Ralph is covered with scabs and sores, neck engorged with blood and arm infested by maggots. His beard is full of vomit. And he has not bathed or shaved for days. But Theon takes Ralph's sword and cuts his throat to end his misery. Ralph Kenning's dead. Theon kill Theon gives him a mercy kill. Interesting. Okay, so I was just looking for clues about Moat Kalen and the you know the disaster there. The putting this storm god's hand there is interesting. So he was in charge of Moat Kalen. Essentially. Until yeah. Theon showed up. And then that's when Dagon Cod kind of like tries to take command when he's like, I'm not Dagon God bounds into no man until he gets an ax in his head. Um, okay. Yeah. So uh, for a, a good example of uh, Carl's got some kennings for us. So um, the Norse uh, phrase that means ship is waves horse. So just like, you know, the Dothraki, Talking about the wooden horses that run on the water. Um, sea steed. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so uh, Mo Kalen, remember, I was saying the fact that Ironborn Squisher folk came and occupied it, the only people we ever see occupy Mo Kalen, um, is a clue that the Squishers built Mo Kalen. And it's interesting that the guy who was in charge of it, literally the storm god. Um, mm -hmm. Which then ties back to the whole, like, hammer of the waters striking Mo Kalen and stuff. So, 
Very cool. That's probably all I got to say about that. So let's talk about Euron. We got a couple of loose houses there. There might be. Oh, there's also House Meyer. What's uh, this? Oh, we really know. Ten nooses, black and white, on a red border of blood. Uh, John Meyer, known as Pinchface, uh, supports Euron. So again, yeah, <laughs> the house with nooses are Euron supporters. Makes sense, and he gifts him a he gifts Euron a dozen long ships. Okay, so then okay, let's go flip over to Euron. So this is by Draft Urgy. Of course, Euron Sigil is tremendous. Black crown, black crows, red eye. Ostensibly, it's his crown and his red blood eye, and he's called crow's eye, so there's crows, right? Well, mm -hmm. this is the picture of the long night, essentially, um, and best way to say it is this way. So there is the red eye and the crown. Uh, it's, I guess it'd be better if... Um, Put it this way. The golden crown of kings is meant to represent the sun's rays. So during the long night, the sun turns dark. So a black crown, it seems evil, obviously, and that's because it's literally like a black sun. It's disturbing to our subconscious, right? So the black sun of the long night is the black crown. Now the eye is the same symbol because it's the black pupil surrounded by red. That's more like what the eclipse looks like where the moon is the black, the cornea, I guess, or the pupil. And then, yeah, the red cornea is that ring of fire around the moon. But, of course, it wasn't just an eclipse. During the long night, it was an explosion. So this red eye represents, it's the god's eye. Remember how I said black water flows from the god's eye, right? The black water rush. Euron, mm -hmm. lord of the black tide, he drinks the black drink and has the sable cloak. So basically, yeah, this is just a picture of the moon exploding with the black ravens being like the black meteors as they're often compared to. Uh, so it's just a picture of an explosion. <laughs> and, that's, that's, and that's why Yarn has a moon face. He's got two eyes. He's got a blue eye like the ice moon. And he's got a, a red bloody exploded eye like the moon that blew up in the past. And... Uh, yeah, like the Eye of Sauron, exactly. It is very Eye of Sauron, thank you, obviously. I'm just reading the chat here. Um, Abraham with the kind of, I don't know if I can answer that one, Abraham, right now. Uh, I think it changed some things. I don't know if I'd say it messed up. Talking about the five-year gap. How do we know Euron is telling the truth about the horn controlling the dragon? Oh, we don't. We don't. Or visiting Valeria. We don't. Well, he didn't make it all up because he's been somewhere and he got that suit of armor from somewhere and the horn from somewhere. Like, he clearly is a powerful wizard that can go to places like Ashai or Valeria. I don't really personally see a reason to doubt any of it myself. Um, I think the evidence is strong that he is Urathon Nightwalker in Karth. So we, that would give him glass candle magic as far back as book two. So I, we don't know. It doesn't really matter. The point is that he has these artifacts that no one's ever seen. Like that Valerian steel armor, no one's ever seen that. Targaryens didn't even have that. That's like in the show they did, but that's in... Um, when Aaron, well, it, I guess that's Aaron's unreliable narrator, but he says such things were seen in Valeria before the Doom. That's when they had Valerian armor. Because it's so much more steel than just a sword to make a whole suit of armor. So, yeah, I tend to think Euron probably has been, definitely been to a shy. And has he been to Valeria? That part, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. If anyone could, it'd be him, though. So, yeah. Yeah, the the Ur I'm definitely on board with the Urathon Nightwalker thing again because of the Urathon Good Brother uh, parallel. Urathon for Good Brother, known as the Bad Brother. 
Uh, he is the one who wins the king's moot and then kills all of his com- all of the- all of his opponents until Torgan Greyiron, who is away. Uh, Torgan the latecomer comes and presses his claim because he was made unaware of the king's moot. Euron is the bad brother. He's the bad brother to Victarion, to Aeron, to Balon. So the Eurothon names fits. Then there's also the story of Euron Grey Iron, Euron Redhand. Uh, he is the Grey Iron King who ditches the Driftwood crown and he becomes the first to wear a black iron crown instead. So these names, Eurothon and Euron, all connecting to Euron, these parallels of the past of these two wicked ironborn kings all me- all mesh so very well with Euron and his current character. And it's more the dichotomy with the black crown and black throne versus the wooden crown and throne and the different mm-hmm. culture associated with each one. So, yes, the Nightwalker. That's him. Lord of the Long Night talks about the Bleeding Star come and gone, and he's going to be a new god rising from the graves and charnel pits. Uh, this artist is Eric Shoemaker, by the way. And we'll go back to the actual Euron one by Draft Ergy. <clears throat> but yeah, he's got all the signs of the apocalypse. Basically, that's it. He's draped in apocalypse imagery from the sable cloak, shade of the evening, the horn, the sigil, the eye... I mean, check out my two Euron videos, um, Euron King of the Apocalypse and Knight's King Crow's Eye, and I break it down in detail. But uh, yeah, that's it. He's, that's, this is the stuff that tells you that Euron isn't just a madman. Like He's literally rising to become the primary villain that isn't a White Walker in the remainder mm-hmm. of this story. It's unquestionably Euron, and all of this long night symbolism and trappings kind of shows you this is the man who's probably going to be most responsible for triggering the apocalypse somehow. So. What do you call a vampire made out of plastic? A urethane night walker. What the? <laughs> Carl Karsnark. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, yeah. Tim, if you have any closing thoughts, let me know, but I'm about ready to wrap it up, I think. Yeah. Just that, like, with a character like Euron, anyone who has a personal sigil, something you have to, is you have to take both their sigils into account. And because Euron being a Greyjoy, he already has enough going for him. And then you add the personal sigil on there and it creates a whole new layer. Uh, we could say the same for Littlefinger. Littlefinger has a Mockingbird, which is a great representation of his personality. But House Baelish, their, their sigil is the Titan of Bravo. So that symbolically makes... Little finger, a giant, which is why he fits the snow giant when Sans is building her snow uh, model of Winterfell. Same thing here, Euron. You got to do the same thing. The cro- the the personal sigil and the family sigil are both equally as important as the other, and both have to be taken together to really map out what the nature of the character is and what their role in the story is going to be. Euron, and I say uh, Euron's like a perfect example of that uh, because he is the yellow kraken, the king in yellow figure, but also the the eye of Sauron, the crow, this the o- this whole Norse Odin figure, which makes him such a penultimate ideal of what an Ironborn should be. And then he wants dragons. Well, if you think of tropes, uh, TV tropes is a great sight, and people sometimes fall down the TV tropes hole. You have what's called the big bad. That's your main villain. But then there's also the secondary villain, which is kind of like, you know, your second strongest villain is usually known as the dragon. So Euron is like the dragon. If the others are the big bad, then Euron is the dragon of the story. Right. And what is he after? He's after dragons. Interesting. Well, um, yeah, and like I said, it's just what when I explored that series, it's so interesting how he's it's just the penultimate evil Azor High and also a Knight's King figure at the same time. By the time you're mm-hmm. pl- done plowing through his symbolism, I just 
There can be no doubt that Knight's King originally was some kind of Azor High person. Like, there's just no way you can shake it. Mm -hmm. So. All right, guys. Well, thanks very much uh, for all your PayPals and Super Chats and questions and clarifications and participation in the chat that made this video better than it would have been otherwise. Thank you for watching the Ironborn video, which is doing awesome. And thank you for subscribing to Grey Waste Tim's channel. And thank you, Tim, for bringing the heat once again, the knowledge. Appreciate you. Oh, of course. Thank you for having me. Iron Ironborn is my jam. They, It's weird. Like, when I first started this story, the Ironborn were my least favorite, and yet they've grown on me and become the ones that I'm most interested in. In any, like, I mean, I'm interested in a lot of aspects of the story, but the art. The Ironborn are in like the top near the in the top five. They're holding yeah. them the Black Fires in the north. I, yep. The first time you read through, it's they're not your favorite chapters always, but yeah, it really does grow on you. I agree with that. Oh, one other thing, the Eye of Sauron thing kind of implies that he's going to do some dark magic on top of the High Tower, doesn't it? It's already implied mm -hmm. that Lord Layton's up there using magic and seeing from there to the wall, which sounds like Palantir stuff. But if you're on, you know, it's long been. Uh, no, I got your PayPal, Kirsty, uh, but you said you didn't want me to read it. So, I saw it. Um, so if uh, you, you did say that, right? You said you didn't want me to read it out loud. Um, so the uh, the Eye of Sauron thing, yeah, the Eye of Sauron lives at the top of the Dark Tower. So if Euron's whatever magic he's gonna do, probably gonna happen at the top of the tower. And then the Eye and of then, Sauron thing. I mean, when he, all he'll have to do actually is just fly his sigil as a banner on top of the high tower. It'll be like, ooh, look, it's Orthanc. Not Orthanc. What's um, Saruman's tower called? I do not know Lord of the Rings like at all. I only know very little. Whatever. The one with the Some eye on like top. Oh, like yeah. Baradur. Baradur. That's it. Yeah. No, Orthanc is, the... Or is Saruman. So I'm, there's two. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm speaking very quickly and sort of conflating things. Orthanc is where Saruman lives. He has a palantir on top of there from which he communicates directly with the Eye of Sauron, which is in Mordor on top of the Tower of Baradur. <laughs> okay, now we're straight. <laughs> <clears throat> Isengard means Iron Tower. That's cool. Uh, I just wanted to bring up like the woman with the pale fire in his hands that in her hands that um the damp hair sees in his vision standing next to Euron and who could be a candidate for that because I have heard because uh, Leighton Hightower is up there with his daughter the Mad Maid uh the Mad Maid and I've heard. Some theories are like maybe she's the woman with the pale fire, but I feel like that's introducing a character so late in the game for her to be it as compared to someone like Danny or Cersei or Melisandre who's been around since like near the beginning. Yeah, I have trouble with the Mad Maid being that person too. Um, so yeah. So Isengard is the name of the whole area with Orthanc being the tower. The thing is Orthanc is kind of, it sounds like fused stone. It's weird black stone that doesn't have any joint made by the Numenorians. It's just not flat. It's like kind of angular or whatever, but um, yeah, it is kind of like an iron tower. So that, that all tracks. Ice on guard. That's what Waymar said. On guard. Ice. <laughs> all right. All right, guys. Love y'all. Let, let me get out of here and go take care of Goose and get some sleep and shit. So, uh, yeah, I'm back at work. I'll be working on the Grey King video. I'll have another cool live stream coming next week. Uh, and that's about it. Again, subscribe to Grey Waste Tim's channel. And uh, yep. that's it. It's been real. Thank you, Tim. Always appreciate you. And thank you. I think Cleo's going to lick the camera here. Oh, maybe not. All right, guys. Have a good week. Good night.